All righty. Um, we are now live and recording. So um, this is kind of unprecedented. As you guys are clearly seeing, I am not Brady or Lindsay. And um, surprisingly, I got requests to do these review sessions um, covering DERS, and I'm kind of shooketh, but I have put together a nice compiled high yield document covering essentially what is covered thus far, weeks one to three. Obviously, certain elements and the finer details haven't been added in because, you know, I'm trying to focus in on the high yields as I put it right here. So, um, as always, the agenda for today, well, before I get started, um, I run Here's the TPLG along with a group of us. Um, Priya is one of our experts on the page, so um, Priya is here live recording with me. And unfortunately, I couldn't hold a live session because I just didn't have time to plan it all out, but um, I did put together this document and hopefully this recording can help anyone who's watching. Um, as always, if you need access to our Facebook page, here's the QR code, um, feel free to join and uh, we have some good resources and links to documents and etc. All right, the agenda for today. Okay, um, I know this is not comprehensive, like I mentioned before, um, but this is the plan. We're going to cover GI pathology first, we're going to cover micro weeks one to three, and then we're going to do endopathology last. And if you guys are wondering why there is no farm on there, that's because if I had thrown in farm, this document would be 300 pages and y'all would be um, even further shook it. So, um, let's get the ball rolling with GI pathology. As always, GI path is just going to cover everything from the oral cavity all the way down below. So um, let's get started from the oral cavity first. So the important thing with this is that leukoplakias are essentially just um, abnormal growths that are happening based off of either a pathological or non-pathological state. Now, the important thing to note is that leukoplakia, leuko meaning white, plakia is like plaque-like composition, is typically found in the base of the stomach, or not the base of the stomach, but the base of the oral cavity. So whenever, you've, whenever you see this, it can often precipitate a pre-malignant kind of diagnosis. So what you tend to have to do is go in for a a diagnosis or a biopsy um, following a positive confirmation for a leukoplakia. And remember, this is not scraped off. Um, if you do see something white in the oral cavity that can be scraped off, that is a differential for candidiasis. Okay, typically it's found in older men and obviously um, buccal mucosa, which is still talking about the oral cavity. It's also found in the tongue as well as the floor of the mouth. So if you guys can remember that, you guys should be good. Now, um, the most associated thing with this is tobacco usage. Chronic friction can happen too with dentures or even having a lot of abrasive foods. Um, and then often you can also think of your human papilloma virus infections with these leukoplakias. And we're talking about leukoplakias and we haven't gone to erythio Plakias yet. Now remember, leukoplakias have cellular pleomorphism, so they've kind of lost their ability to um, maintain one regular shape. So if you have that in mind, then you know right off the bat that this is a dysplastic change. And remember, dysplasia from our FTCM days isn't often just purely malignant. It is reversible at, to a certain degree, but you just have to remember that whenever you're dealing with this, that you could potentially have some sort of malignancy with this, okay? Now, the important thing to note is that there are other types of leukoplakias. There is erythroplakia. And now, whenever you think of erythro, you often kind of jump into the understanding of vasculature and blood supply. So this is when you have a kind of a red velvety eroded structure. And this is a little bit more ominous because it can become malignant. So if you think of malignancy, think more so of your erythroplakia because now you have vascular involvement. And if you know one thing about um, precancerous uh, changes, vascularization is one of the leading ways that it can go down this rabbit hole. Now there is a hairy leukoplakia, and this is tends to be not so malignant, but it is associated a lot more with HIV patients, especially when they're um, CD4 count gets very low. Um, often it's associated with EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. And remember, 
going back to our RHS days, this is going to present with a positive monospot test, right? So what are you going to see elevated? Your paracortex T cells. So just a little bit of cumulative knowledge. And remember the, comp uh, the component that's really involved with um, oral hair oral hairy leukoplakia is hyperkeratosis, right? So that is changes in the buc buccal mucosa with the keratin that's involved. Um, when you guys see the kind of the pre-malignant com composition, you're going to see in terms of which can go into where. Now, your, your common cancers of the oral cavity tends to be both squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma. So if you guys remember those two, it's gonna give you a good perspective on what type of malignancies can often occur. Now, remember our oral cavity, like anything that gets exposed out into the world is comp composed of um, stratified squamous, right? So you can obviously imagine squamous cells, so squamous carcinoma. Now, if there's adenocarcinomas, those typically at the oral cavity happen at the salivary gland, right? Um, typically, um, your parotid gland is affected and that tends to become malignant. And often the carcinogens involved is alcohol and tobacco, like most things. Now, the risk factor in terms of greatest to least is going to be erythroplakia, leukoplakia, and at very, very low levels, hairy cell leukoplakia, okay? If you guys have that kind of overall rank order of this, then you're going to be solid. Now, remember the main risk factors, like I mentioned, tobacco, alcohol usage, as well as HPV, you should be good, right? Now, let's look at a little bit back to our DM days when we talked about um, the development of the GI, um, GIT. Now, the important thing to note is that the blind upper and lower esophageal um, kind of changes happens due to typically um, some kind of a congenital issue. Now, the congenital issue can either deal with oligohydramnios, polyhydramnios, um, and they often have a lot of different other changes associated with them. So these aren't looked at in isolation. And I threw in a bit of cumulative information from back in the day, talking about our bacterial kind of changes, which are your vertebral anomalies, anal atresia, cardiac anomalies, tracheoesophageal fistulas, which are what we're currently looking at. You have esophageal atresia, um, renal anomalies, and then limb malformations. And that those are all often associated with um, changes in your amniotic fluid. Now, the most common one of all of them is the um, type B, right? The type B that's outlined here. And that's typically seen with this um, kind of a blind end of your esophagus, and then you having a fistula going directly into the trachea. So what are you gonna likely see is that you're gonna have increased gas formation, even though there's no food going in and the baby immediately after it starts feeding is typically going to vomit. Now, you're probably wondering what type of vomit it's gonna be no bile in there because remember there, there's no point where it's reached the bile yet. So this vomit is just directly just undigested food. So immediately as it hits this point, it tends to rebound back out. Okay. Now the other component is the fistula that kind of forms this H shape, right? Um, and if you can imagine this, this is kind of an H, right? So it's a fistula without an atresia. So there is a connecting point. You're going to see increased gas entry, right? Or just air entry into the um, esophagus and the stomach. So just keep that in mind. Upon each inspiratory cycle, air is going in as well as food. So whenever you do any sort of radiographic imaging, you're going to see a lot of um, gas buildup in the uh, stomach, especially. Alrighty, you can also have um, your food come back out. Since this is a connecting point, a common kind of condition that comes back to bite us, right, in terms of vomitus is Klebsiella, right? That's something that we also reviewed in RHS. Okay, now this is really important in terms of esophageal webs versus rings, right? Your esophageal webs, right, are partial, right? They don't, they're not completely full circle constrictions, right? Um, typically, it's caused by a mucosal protrusion, and it's often associated with women, right? A lot of our conditions that we're going to see are associated with women, and we're going to outline the importance of that. Um, typical conditions that we see is plumber vinson syndrome, and you can have glossitis, you can have iron deficiency. Um, there's a nice mnemonic that plumbers die. So like the dye is talking about the glossitis, kilosis, and the iron deficiency that are coming together, as well as gastroesophageal refluxes.
Okay. And remember, whenever you're thinking of uh, webbing, think of spiders. And if you think of spiders, then you should you can quickly think of your carcinoma, since these often happen in the upper half of your esophageal kind of track. Um, they're often associated with the upper cancers, which is your squamous cell carcinoma. And we're going to cover the upper versus lower in a hot minute. Right. And like I mentioned, these are semicircumferential lesions. They're not going to be all the way through like the other one that we're going to cover, which is going to be a full circle. Right. It's going to do a complete um, circumferential thickening slash constriction. That can be quite bad because if it's above the gastroesophageal junction, you can have any sort of malignancy develop. Um, both your, your esophageal ones, right? Esophageal squamous cell ones, as well as your gastric um, adenocarcinoma as well, kind of developing with these two. So adenocarcinomas as well as squamous cell carcinomas tend to appear with these. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, in terms of tears, right? Obviously tears aren't good. We don't want anything kind of being ripped apart in our GIT, right? Because it often just means you have likelihood for bacteria to settle in. You also have chances of um, straight up food and other particles going into the wrong places, right? And you don't want things that are supposed to be staying in the stomach, leaving the stomach region to go anywhere else. Now, the often one that comes to our mind, um, whenever we think of alcoholics and, um, bulimics is the Mallory Weiss tear. Now you're thinking Mallory Weiss, right? There's two L's in there. So if you can think of that, then you know what type of actual tear it is. It's a longitudinal superficial tear, right? Remember, these tend to heal on their own and they're caused by alcohol intoxication leading to vomitus, or it can be often associated with um, neurological slash psychiatric consult uh, disorders such as bulimia. Um, not so much with anorexia, depending on if there's a bulimic tendency with it, it could also precipitate this. Now, your Borhave syndrome, um, this one is quite bad. This has to have surgical intervention because what happens is um, it literally causes the your esophagus to be ripped apart. And since it's a transmural, it's affecting all three layers, right? Your mucosa, submucosa, adventitia components all get ripped apart. And it's often followed with severe retching, right? It's basically when retching, if you guys haven't experienced it, God forbid, it's basically when you literally can't vomit. So um, you're just dry heaving, and that is going to cause these very high amount of pressure to build up and leading to the esophagus literally to split open. And you don't want that because whenever you have um, your esophagus split open, air and any sort of secretory fluids enters the mediastinum. And remember, um, our mediastinum holds a lot of really important things, lungs, heart, um, your, your so many different vasculature can be affected by this. So severe mediastinitis is associated with this. So keep that in mind and you should be good. Remember, surgical intervention, really, 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 it's an emergency, right? It's like an aortic dissection level of emergency. Like I mentioned, it's going to be in terms of Mallory-wise longitudinal tear, right? but um, it's only going to be superficial. So they tend to heal on their own and they only affect the mucosa and the submucosa. If you have that in mind, you're going to be solid, right? Um, just a quick overview of our DM knowledge. Remember that any part of our gastroesophageal um, as well as your typical GIT system has different layers. So there is the mucosa, there is the submucosa, then there is the wonderful, wonderful muscularis mucosa, and then there is the lamina propria, and then you have your muscularis propria, and then finally your adventitia. So it's a very thick kind of proper structure that's helping to maintain food where it's supposed to be. Um, if there's a tear, it's typically due to some kind of pathological changes, whether it's like the Mallory Weiss or the Borhave syndrome that we've seen. All right. Reflux esophagitis. This sounds like exactly what it is. So it's when your gastric content comes yeeting back out. It's not fun. Okay. So what you need to think of most often with this is that there is going to be GERD involved, right? It's the most common kind of presentation. Um, you can also have some kind of elevated levels of increased acid secretion with this, right? Um, let's say there's, you know, any sort of GERD level changes, you're going to have transition or metaplasia of the cells at the site. So it's going to go from stratified squamous, right, which is readily good and solid to um, your wonderful, wonderful um, 
your, your duodenal level of changes, which are often associated with your columnar, right? Your columnar cells with, um, with secretory um, cells involved with them. So if you guys can remember that, that transition from stratified squamous to columnar, then you should be solid as to what's happening with reflex esophagitis at the cellular level, right? This is cellular reprogramming at the stem cell level. This is once again, an FTCM concept coming back in full swing. Now, a little bit of random tidbit information, right? Um, significant gastric reflux is actually often associated with eosinophils. And you're like wondering, wait, if this if there's inflammation and damage, why isn't there neutrophils? It's because of the fact that eosinophils are actually lining a lot of our GIT already in order to combat a lot of things. So they're readily at hand to destroy and maintain any sort of um, virus or anything that actually more so parasites and in other components at the site. So that's why it's eosinophilic as compared to neutrophilic in terms of your reflux disease. So eosinophil, not neutrophils, keep that in mind. Other kind of complications, bleeding, strictures, all sorts of other stuff. Strictures are basically when um, you have over and over kind of chronic issues thrown at your esophagus that leads to the tightening or constriction of increased fibrosis in the actual esophagus leading to the tightening of the esophagus. So that can be quite bad. Food and digestion can actually be affected. If patients could lose weight, so many different things can happen altogether. Okay, my favorite, we've literally heard it since the dawn of time, Barrett's esophagus. You guys already know it's the metaplasia of the squamous cells to the columnar cells, right? Remember, they're transitioning. They got to be um, transitioning into columnar because they're more reflective of how cells are in the actual intestinal cells, right? They're better, better at handling the increased acid content. Your stratified squamous is better at handling um, mechanical injury or straight up insult to itself um, based off of maybe like sharp foods or anything. Like you can have a very like harsh piece of bread that you didn't swallow properly or chew properly, and it can still mess up your stratified squamous, but that wouldn't lead to Barrett's esophagus. You would need chronic exposure to acid content to lead to this very columnar epithelium with goblet cells to combat um, your constant acid exposure, okay? It's, uh, it looks very scary, right? Like all this red is the actual transition, right? It's chronic insult to this location, followed by um, those columnar goblet cells. All right, now esophageal varices, very simple. We've seen this again. It's basically precipitated um, by some kind of portal hypertension. It is a very classic hallmark symptom, right? They call it torturous veins, submucosal level, now you're wondering why does portal hypertension have to deal with the esophagus? They're kind of farther away from each other than you would think. Um, it's actually, they're very close. And the way the vasculature kind of runs in this area is um, really important. Obviously you guys are seeing blood kind of being pulled into the luminal space and you guys can see all of these torturous veins. So what's really happening here? It's portal hypertension. And I'm going to show you guys why. But before we do that, I just want to note some malignancy. You can have actually hepatocellular carcinoma leading to esophageal varices, as well as chronic cirrhosis, right? Whenever you have alcoholics, they've had long years of drinking, you know, five shots of tequila every night um, before going to bed. We're talking about esophageal varices as a common um, condition that develops later on, right? Cirrhosis, more long-term kind of uh, portal hypertension that you're going to see. Okay. Now I mentioned portal hypertension. So what's really happening here? So pressure from any sort of liver pathology is going to back up, right? It's going to back up. It's going to mess with the spleen, right? Spleen is lo located right here. Um, you're going to have as well, the pressure build up so much that it actually goes and via the left gastric vein, I want you guys to take note of that left gastric vein, um, leading to from portal hypertension to the esophageal veins. And these are the superficial esophageal veins that I mentioned of the esophagus that's affected. Okay. All right. Malignancies. Everyone loves them or no one loves them, but like, it's important that we understand them properly because in the esophagus, it's quite simple. Now, 
in the upper two thirds of your esophagus, it's squamous cell carcinoma. And remember squamous, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, it's like Mr. Worldwide. So there's a worldwide presentation of this because it tends to be more common, right? Versus adenocarcinoma, think of your Americas, A for America, so adenocarcinoma. So if you have that very simple principle in mind, you have a good understanding of where things are going to happen. Remember that your upper esophagus is divided into transitional zones. The upper one third, right, is stratified squamous and it has um, skeletal muscle involvement. And that's like you have sensory control of how much you can eat and swallow and et cetera, right? Then there's a transition point where it goes from skeletal, which is the next two thirds, right? Um, it's going to be the transition between skeletal to smooth, right? And then finally, when you get to the lower third, it's straight up just smooth muscle work and it's magic. So that's why I want you guys to kind of run through this analogy. So remember, whenever we think of anything exposed out into the world, we think of stratified squamous, think of skeletal muscle and having conscious involvement with it. Whenever you're thinking of adeno, think about like secretory, because remember adenocarcinoma is talking about changes to glandular structure that's gone malignant. So think of your smooth muscle. Your smooth muscles aren't really involved with your gland stuff, right? So think about that way. Now, squamous cell carcinoma, remember the most common type is often gonna be found in worldwide locations, right? It's mostly dealing with like exposure to alcohol, tobacco, like. Um, achalasia, right? It's like when you have decreased tone of your actual um, esophagus that leads to too much tightening and you basically can't eat food and so on and so forth. Now, it's often seen in areas such as Iran, Central China, Hong Kong, Brazil, pretty much everywhere besides the Americas. Now, your adenocarcinoma, likely think whenever you think of adenocarcinoma, think of your GERD, right? Barrett's esophagus, GERD, right off the bat, you have a very good understanding what is happening here. Now, you guys can see the changes, right? You can see the um, the kind of the rich deposition of glandular structure here versus your kind of metaplasia of the squamous um, cells here. So that's, that's the kind of the important thing. Remember also there's HPV involvement. Whenever you think of HPV or um, herpes virus or human papilloma virus, um, both of those can lead to um, metaplasia, dysplasia, and eventually neoplasia, especially at the squamous cell level. Whereas the adenocarcinomas tend to be less so associated with viruses and more so with um, GERD. Okay. All right, my favorite congenital pyloric stenosis. I don't know why this thing always stuck with me since DM. What you need to know is that there's an olive-like mass, okay? Literally, you're palpating the baby, you find a little knot, and the baby's just straight up throwing up projectile vomiting all over the place. Okay, that sounds quite horrible, but the important thing to note is that it's congenital, right? It's born into this. And most often the condition is Turner syndrome, trisomy 18, which is Edwards syndrome and the esophageal atresia, right? These are all cumulative concepts that we've seen time and time again. Now, where are you gonna be palpating this baby? Right upper quadrant, epigastric area. Both of those tend to be the regions that doctors go to. Um, and what you gotta do in terms of surgical correction is myotomy. So you're going to do a pyloric myotomy. So basically you're going to go in there surgically and literally scrape out any sort of extra um, tissue and development that's there and make sure that it becomes nice and patent um, because acquired stenosis can be often associated with other malignancies such as gastritis, peptic ulcers, even H. pylori can precipitate this. So keep that in mind. Talking about lovely gastritis, what did I tell you guys? Remember, you don't take NSAIDs on an empty stomach. That is like the one of the most hardcore thing that my mom taught me. Never take NSAIDs on an empty stomach because what happens is um, whenever you're taking that, you're messing up the production of prostaglandin E1 and E2, right? Remember your cyclooxygenase inhibitor, NSAIDs, right? Really important. You guys know all of that from FDCM as well as um, RHS, as well as CRS pretty much every module, okay? Um, so also the drinking of alcohol as well as oral iron supplements can have effects on the erosive gastritis. Now, you've, you're probably wondering what type of actual gastritis do we get? Remember that a gastritis is very superficial. It doesn't go deep, right? Erosive, so think of just the first two layers, the mucosa and the submucosa tends to be affected. Whereas a straight up ulcer penetrates all through layers. So whenever you're thinking of ulcers, 
think of different types of ulcers. So your curling ulcers, think of it associated with severe burns and um, sort of trauma that's leading to a lot of blood loss. So think of it this way, you burn your hair on a curling iron, and that's how I remember curling ulcers are associated with, um, I don't know why I think of curling irons, but apparently I'm into curling irons nowadays. So Cushing um, ulcers are associated with increased intracranial pressure. You're probably wondering, huh, Cushing's disease, Cushing, um, no, not the analogy I would go for it. You wanna cushion your brain, right? That's why your increased intracranial pressure, your cerebral spinal fluid is the cushion that protects your brain. So Cushing, think of it. Um, so why, why do we get these actual ulcers? It's because when you get increased vagal stimulation, right, your vagus nerve, your vagus nerve has almost a direct line from the brain all the way down to your stomach, okay? So it can lead to acetylcholine release, and that acetylcholine can increase the amount of movement on the screen, I apologize, um, but it, it leads to increased gastric secretions because acetylcholine has positive um, parasympathetic effects on the stomach, so think of a lot more gastric secretion leading to ulcers and gastritis, right? Now, the chronic presentation of non-erosive gastritis, what's the likely cause? H. pylori. A good chunk of the time, H. pylori. Anything else aside from that is autoimmune, right? Autoimmune gastritis. So these are also called um, type B or type A. Think of it very simply, A for autoimmune, uh, B for bacteria, right? That's the way I kind of remember it. The other ones aren't common, radiation and mechanical injury, right? Those tend to be often less seen because our, our systems are built to withstand a lot of this. But what you need to know is any sort of gastritis is happening at the stomach because remember gastric is the stomach region. Um, so it's gonna present with epigastric pain. So you chuck in, you're chugging alcohol, you're popping those NSAIDs and you just have a whole lot of bile production, right? Those are the likely culprits. Your acute gastritis, right? It's associated, like I said, extensive burns, right? That leads to hypovolemia, right? Your blood volume, as well as your prostaglandins, as well as the mucus that's produced all have a protective effect on your stomach, right? So that it doesn't burn through, right? Because hydrochloric acid, believe it or not, can burn your face off. So important thing to note is that when you have decreased perfusion to the stomach due to an extensive burn and loss of volume, that's not one of the ways your body can buffer the system anymore. All it has left is prostaglandins and mucus. It can't really do much with that. It needs all three trifecta to make sure that you don't develop these gastric ulcers, right? Um, once again, head, head injuries I already mentioned. Remember, increased vagal stimulation and then massive upper gastroesophageal bleeds are often seen with this because, you know, the it can get so severe that it can lead to um, your full-fledged ulcers, right? Ulcers are affecting all the way through all different layers, right? And that can lead to air formation and actually can present with shoulder pain. And you're like, where, how, why, why is this happening? It's because the, the stomach, right, is producing so much air and the, and the bacteria and all the other things involved in that region actually leads to air coming into the, um, the abdominal cavity. And where does air go? It doesn't go down. It obviously goes up. So it's going to go and um, irritate the peritoneum, right? And especially the peritoneum as well as the, uh, the diaphragm. And think about it in terms of diaphragm, phrenic nerve. And if it's the gastric, right? So what's it going to be? Right shoulder pain that can often be presented with gastric ulcers. That is a fifth order connection that I made today. Lovely. All right. Conic gastritis, like I mentioned, H. pylori autoimmune, right? Most common causes. Let's do a quick analysis. H. pylori, right? Um, from our understanding of micro, it's a gram negative. It's curvy linear, which means literally two opposite things, but it's actually just curvy. Okay. Just don't, don't get it twisted. It's motile. The reason it needs to be motile is because it likes to hang out in the antrum. And that's a very hallmark feature. It's non-invasive. It's just going to hang out on the mucosa level, suck up all of that mucosa. It's going to produce a whole bunch of urease and it's going to change your whole gastric pH. All right. Hella important. Need to know down solid. Right. And I've given all the pictures here. Right. But this is the one that they like to ask about the H. pylori that's hanging out in the mucosal level. Now, the the immunological ones is typically autoimmune in nature, and typically it follows after some kind of viral infection. Um, 
it's common that way, but even then H. pylori tends to be the most dominating thing that leads to chronic gastritis, okay? I'm gonna cover H. pylori a little bit more in depth, but the important thing to know with autoimmune gastritis is that it affects a certain region of your stomach. Now the stomach is broken down into several different regions. There's the fundic, right? That's the first thing that the food meets when it comes into your stomach area. There's the body, which is a good chunk of the actual stomach area. And then there's the ant, well, there is the antrum as well as the pyloric region, right? It makes sense, right? That it's gonna eventually go into the pyloric kind of cavity and then eventually into the duodenum. So important that you guys know that at the body slash fundic level, autoimmune gastritis. What is this gonna present with? Autoimmune, they're gonna affect the parietal cells. It's gonna present with achloridia, right? And hypergastremia. That's because your body's like, well, I got a whole bunch of food. Like I gotta make sure I'm making hydrochloric acid to break it down. So it's gonna hyper secrete gastrin. But there's literally autoimmune destruction of your parietal cells. So what can it do? It can't do anything. So it's gonna be achloritic in nature. And then um, you're gonna, since the fact that you're messing up your parietal cells, right? You're no longer having the ability to add those wonderful intrinsic factors that are eventually gonna be um, involved in taking up of B12. And that's gonna lead to pernicious anemia. So a nice review from our RHS days, what type of anemia is this gonna present with? Macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, cool. Okay, carcinoid tumors can often appear from this because remember this is often seen with carcinoid um, autoimmune kind of presentation and then gastric adenocarcinoma. Remember there's a lot of glandular tissue. So if there's any sort of malignancy or autoimmune attack of it, then it can have increased turnover of cells and those turnovers can lead to potential malignancies. As always, give them B12 and keep them monitored and potentially give immunosuppression agents. Bacterial gastritis, you guys know this very well, H. pylori, 80% of the time, it's the most common type. And then finally, it's going to lead to, you know, your peptic ulcers, your maltomas, gastromas, all sorts of stuff. Um, but remember, proton pump inhibitors and antibiotics, right? Really, 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 really important. You got to give those proton pump inhibitors. But if you give proton pump inhibitors, fun fact, you can't actually test if the H. pylori bacteria is still active. So it actually leads to a decrease and results in kind of a false, you know, false negative. Okay. All right. Um, chemical gastritis. You guys know this. Don't take your NSAIDs on an empty stomach. My mama is going to yell at you. Um, so just keep that in mind and you should be good. Okay. Gastric adenocarcinomas. Guys, whenever you think of adenocarcinoma, think of a, a sort of malignancy that's happening at the glandular tissue. So what type of glandular tissue do we have, right? We have a lot of glandular tissues. We have parietal cells, we have chief cells, we have a lot of different ones working in tandem to make sure you're creating those wonderful hydrochloric acid. Um, what is this gonna present with? Peptic ulcers, chronic kind of pain, right? So many different things and the most likely cause of gastric adenocarcinomas in the stomach, right, is due to the fact that you're taking too much of those cooked smoked meat, okay? Um, so you're going to see it a lot in, in locations where they like to smoke and cook their meat. You can actually cook um, meat over gas stoves, and those are fine, but if you add charcoal to it, that's the one that's problematic, so just keep that in mind. Um, Japan, Chile, Costa Rica, Eastern Europe, and South Korea are all implicated here. It's also more associated with lower economic groups. So keep that in mind if um, you have your differentials. Okay. Now there's two different types, right? There's the intestinal and then there's the diffuse, right? The diffuse one I want to cover first because it tends to be a little bit more high yield. Diffuse is associated with E. cadherin, right? You're like, wait, that sounds kind of familiar. Well, E. cadherins are really involved with connecting the epithelium or any sort of structure that is held together and working in tandem. So they're cell to cell connections, right? Um, the buzzword for diffuse type is going to be the signet ring cells. That's because there's mucus producing cells that are often involved with this. And they're also associated with linitis plastica. Sounds like a made up name, but it is straight up just thickening of the stomach due to the neoplasia, right? It, remember, it's diffuse. The entire stomach gets a little thicker than a snicker and boom, you have a diffuse type. And important to note is that there's actually multiple different um, diffuse presentation with this. The intestinal one, I like to think is like 
um, intentionally sequestered. So typically it's going to lead to localized malignancy, right, of glandular tissue, right, due to the constant kind of um, damage associated with H. pylori, right? I told you guys 80% of the time, H. pylori, boom. Okay, diffuse type. Important to know, Krukenberg tumors, okay? I don't know how, but like apparently the stomach is connected to the ovaries and that's how apparently they connect to each other. I guess we'll learn about it later on. But the important thing to note is that they actually can pass through um, in terms of circulatory system and eventually get to the ovaries. Certain cancers have certain preferred tissue that they like to go to and Krukenberg tumors are a kind of dual presentation of the, both the stomach as well as the ovaries being affected. Now, we've heard of Virchow nodes since the dawn of time, um, even in term one, it's basically any sort of GIT malignancy that is presenting at the left supraclavicular, not the right, put the left supraclavicular, okay? If you put the right, you're talking about like a completely different half of your vasculature slash lymphatics, okay? Now, you, you want to say a prayer to your sister Mary Joseph, and that's going to be your subcutaneous periumbilical metastasis. Okay, you're like, wait a minute, what, why do we have periumbilical metastasis? What really happens is that you're actually getting these malignant cells, they're going to repatent these periumbilical structures, and that's going to present with protrusion of the umbilicus, okay, or the, um, your, I, I make it sound fancy, but it's just your belly button kind of starting to protrude out due to malignancy. Okay, cool. Now the bloom shelf one, it's basically, um, you know, you have a palpable mass that's going to the recto uterine pouch, right? Remember the pouch of Douglas, coldocentesis, ER coming back in full swing. All righty. So these are all associated with this kind of diffuse presentation, right? Now, the final thing, I want to put a little asterisk on it. Acanthosis niagarican is really important because acanthosis niagarican actually is seen in a lot of different places, right? It's a perineoplastic syndrome. It's basically darkening of the armpit slash the um, neck region, as well as several different points that they can, it can actually be seen even in um, diabetes mellitus. So don't, don't start diagnosing your patients with acanthosis Niagara can and saying they have some kind of cancer when they could just be having diabetes. Okay. Like you guys can manage diabetes. Cancers is a little bit scarier prognosis. Okay. Gastrointestinal stoma. Um, Remember, this is just, and typically they arise from mesenchymal. Remember, mesenchymal is connective tissue. Intestinal cells of Kahal, which I'm probably butchering and giving a bad name to whoever that person is, are the intrinsic pacemaker cells of the stomach, right? If you guys can remember that, um, what it essentially is leading to is multi-system cancers. Often they present in the esophagus, stomach, because remember these pacemaker cells are involved with the propulsion and segmentation of your food, right? Propulsion is leading to peristalsis. Um, segmentation is involving churning the food, right? Can, can either be benign or malignant, but you got to kind of, you know, use some clinical judgment endoscopy to confirm. Now, you guys would probably have forgotten this is associated with C-kit, right? So it's your tyrosine kinase right? So what can you use to give um, kind of treatment for this? Imatinib, right? You guys have seen your tyrosine kinase inhibitors since the dawn of time, or at least for the past three modules. So keep that in mind. Um, they can also arise due to platelet growth factors. So um, that is very less common. So associate this with C kit, right? I like to think of C as in the colon, even though that's involved with the gastrointestinal system uh, and the stomach mostly. But C kit, think of colonic tyrosine kinase, right? All right, important thing since you guys aren't here and you guys are watching this recording, Meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum. Please put that into understanding because true diverticulum involves an outpouching due to the entire vessel, like entire lumen low vessel that you're looking at, right? Most often it's associated with the rule of two, right? 2% of the population, two ice in males, two inches long, even though like people use five centimeters and believe in the imperial system more because America and two feet of ileocecal valve. Okay. Important to know that. Okay. The rule of two, you got to know it cold. Now, what really happens here? Your vitalin duct basically just says, yeah, I'm not going to involute. So mid gut to yolk sac is connected um, via this vitalin duct, right? It's supposed to go bye-bye after six weeks, but it decides to hang around like a clingy X, okay? Um, and that leads to essential presentation of Meckel's diverticulum, right? The two rules, right? 
it's all three layers affected. So it's gastric mucosa or pancreatic tissue. So this is really important because when you do immunohistochemistry staining or any sort of biopsy, you're going to actually see likely two types of glandular tissue, right? Gastric as well as pancreatic. All righty. So most often they can lead to hemorrhaging, intestinal obstruction, diverticulitis, perforations, fistulas. You guys know all of this because any sort of outpouching can do literally the exact same thing. You ain't unique, Meckel. All right. So this is how it looks like. Um, let's say Meckel's diverticulum. Whenever the baby passes meconium and it comes, it comes out of the uh, umbilical region, you're like, oh, shoot, like the baby's pooping out of its belly button. Um, no, the baby's like passing stool. That's because the patency of the vitellin duct is still there. Now, what if urine was coming up? That's because you have a patency of the uracle. These are all cumulative questions that you guys can have in BSCE2. I'm just putting it into your mind because I am high functioning and I remember random details instead of actual pertinence. Cool. So here's the rule of two, once again, outlined for all of y'all for your edification, right? So two types of mucosal lining. So remember that's the stomach as well as the pancreatic ones can present in terms of the biopsy that you do, okay? Ileocecal stuff, I'm gonna tell you guys, ileocecal comes back literally for everything, okay. Celiac. So this is basically what every Californian has. Um, we can't have wheat, rye, or barley, and we're apparently allergic to it. But honestly, this is actually a serious condition because it's an autoimmune condition and it's um, your body's hypersensitivity reaction to food. Um, what you need to know is that age typically tends to be 30s to 60s, basically every hipster all the way to your early grandmothers. And um, it's detected twice as more often in women because um, any sort of menstrual bleeding leads to the accumulated effect of poor iron absorption. You guys got to know that celiac deals with iron absorption. If you guys remember your DM knowledge, remember iron fist bro, right? Iron fist bro essentially means the mnemonic is um, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. So iron fist bro. Iron is talking about the duodenal involvement of absorption of any sort of iron. That's why you guys are seeing iron absorption being messed up. And that's why women are more likely to be seen with this because men, we don't lose blood and uh, iron composition as quickly. Okay. So affects males and females equally, but clinically men aren't going to show up to the clinic as often. Um, they're just going to start adopting, I don't know, wheat free bread apparently. So, or become Californians, one of those things. Autoimmune association, you just need to know DQ2, okay? Two, I like to think like two pieces of bread, right, is what you need to make peanut butter jelly sandwich. Um, you can't have that with celiac disease. Um, and then HLA DQ8, that's also associated with this, but DQ2, very important. All right, so what's happening with these villis? You know, they just start blunting like nobody's problem. Okay, so they, the blunting that you see here is straight up blunting, right? They're going to present with poor absorption, especially at the duodenal region. And the two important thing that I want you guys to remember, aside from the blunting, is that it's associated with um, CD8 destruction of the villi, right? The other thing I want you guys to know is a serological test for them. You need to do an assessment for either antigladin or anti-endomesial antibodies or for the transglutaminase antibodies. You're like, wait, that's three. Well, technically the galadin and the endomesial antibodies are combined together and the transglutaminase is by itself. So if you guys do this, then you guys have a good understanding. Now, the thing with celiac is you're gonna actually have IgA kind of um, accumulate because this is a hypersensitivity reaction. It's T cell mediated type four. What's gonna happen is, um, when galadin comes in, right, it basically gets transaminated into a deaminated galadin. And then your body's like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Galadin, deaminated, hold up. We can't have that. So HLA, right, basically says, well, let's take this and present it to our CD4 cells. And then your CD8 cells also get involved because they're like, well, all these cells are involved with the conversion of all this. So CD8 is going to come in and start destroying stuff as well. So Keep that in mind. This is going to have blunting. You're going to have villus atrophy, okay, buzzword, followed by cryptic hyperplasia. Why are your crypts going high? Well, if they're not part of a gang. If they're just going hyperplastic because of the fact that there's so much lymphatic activity associated with the antigladin. 
okay? Very important atrophy um, with hyperplasia. Lovely. Tropical spruce. What's the difference? I don't know. People are going to the tropics and eating weird stuff, but essentially they get sick, right? They get sick and it's a bacterial infection. We don't know what bacteria because ain't nobody got time for that. We just give them any sort of antibiotic, right? To wipe out any sort of messed up bacteria that's in their system. And it's actually improves, right? They, they don't, they don't lose out on, on everything. Like how you see with celiac. Celiac, on the other hand, can't be reversed with antibiotics. So what are the type of things you're going to see with tropical spruce? Tropical spruce can affect any part of your intestinal system, right? Whereas celiac, it tends to prefer the early part of the small intestine. So your duodenum, your jejunum, like er your early duodenum and your early jejunum can be affected. And that's why you're seeing um, a lot of loss of essential things like your iron and your folate and all sorts of things. That's why with tropical spruce, it can affect the entire shebang. So you're going to get megaloblastic anemia because guess what? B12 went bye-bye. Folate because your jejunum is now affected. And that's where folate gets, remember, iron fispro. That's why it, it comes in hand. Um, to know that, you're going to have hypo albuminemia because you're in a freaking freak out mode, hypocalcemia because you can't absorb calcium, intestines are involved with calcium absorption, vitamin D because it's fat, right? Remember fat soluble vitamins are also messed up um, and you can't properly make it and with vitamin D deficiencies are also can be problematic, right? Mainly affects the duodenum and the jejunum, but may progress into the ileum, and that's why you're seeing a whole bunch of stuff being messed up, whereas celiac likes to stay in the upper um, half of stuff. Okay. Remember it improves with antibiotics. Now Whipples. Okay. You're like, wait a minute. That sounds like a bacteria. I know exactly. It's because it's associated with trypanema whippley. Okay. It's a gram positive sickle shaped bacteria. Apparently it's kind of a badass, but what happens is essentially it causes a multi-system chronic kind of intestinal joint and central nervous system level of damage and it can lead to a lot of different things. Now, the important thing to know is that the lamina propria contains these um, past positive granules, okay? That's very important, okay? A similar presentation can be seen with microbacterium tuberculosis. So um, I want you guys to keep that as your DDXs, but for now, just know Whipple's disease, lamina propria, got some granules going for it, past staining, as well as you're going to do a zeal Nelson for ruling out TB. It's a rod shaped, it's a gram positive, it's doing its own thing, living its best life, okay? Um, remember foamy, right? It's associated with Whipple's, okay? Foamy Whipple, like think of whipped cream or something. Okay, cool. All right, intestinal obstruction, everyone's favorite. Now there's two types, there's mechanical and there's non-mechanical. Non-mechanical is just something literally stopping it from doing its thing, right? So, whereas mechanical tends to be actual issues at hand that's either congenital or caused by something else. So hernias, intestinal adhesions and in intersections, right? Um, and then valvulus, okay? Now, a nice cumulative question, valvulus, right? is associated with the coffee bean sign. It's basically when your intestines say, uh, I don't think I'm gonna hang out like best friends, we're gonna start twisting up and fighting. So that's gonna present with um, the coffee bean sign due to the twisting of these. And it's gonna present with gas in both locations. So coffee bean sign, so like this, that's a coffee bean. Okay, hernias, they're bad, okay? You don't want anything herniating into anything, whether it's at the um, rectal canal all, all, or at the uh, GIT system, bad. Now, the buzzword for intersection, sausage-like mass. If you're doing palpitations, um, not palpitations, palpations of the abdomen, you're going to see this basic sausage-like mass when you palpate, deep palpation, okay? Often cause of intersection in children is typically um, some kind of viral or bacterial infection. It leads to um, lymphatic hyperplasia. And that hyperplasia, basically, since their GIT is so small, it starts um, messing around with the mechanical state of how everything gets laid out. And it basically causes this kind of loss of proper structuring and leads to it, the folding in. So that's a very important kind of buzzwordy thing. Acute appendicitis, really important. Um, you guys know this, McBarney's point, right lower quadrant, rebound test, Rovoski signs, SOA signs, basically every sign that you can think of, you're throwing at the appendix. Remember, once again, 
appendix, it's a normal diverticulum. It's a vestigial organ. Males tend to be more affected, like myself. Um, bye bye went the appendix for me. And remember, it's typically caused by some bacterial or um, a, a, a piece of stool that is hanging out in the appendix. And they, there's no way for it to be ejected out because the appendix doesn't have all the comp uh, important structures to move along food and stool. Okay. Tumors of the appendix. Um, I don't know why the appendix likes to hold on to carcinoid tumors, but apparently it likes to. So that it has well differentiated neuroendocrine stuff. Um, you can also get. Um, a mucous neoplasia, right? This is often seen in adults greater than 60 years of age, right? And this is, tends to be like increased glandular pro proliferation leading to adenocarcinomas. And that can be bad because you don't want your appendix rupturing because that's bad. Peritonitis, death are very likely. Hirschsprung's disease, you're like, wait a minute, I know that word. Um, it's toxic megacolon. It's often associated with the fact that um, down children, down syndromes, children tend to have this, right? It's due to a mutation in the receptor tyrosine, um, kind of kinase pathway. You don't need to know the specific one, but, um, here you just need to know that it's associated with increased male preponderance and down syndrome. And typically you just got a ganglionic presentation. So there's no, there's no Mesner's, there's no Orbach. It got, it got nothing. It's a ganglionosis. So none of that, right? So, Whenever you're thinking of the distended component, the distended component actually has the ganglion. The non-distended component, right, the one that has nothing in it, that's the one that's narrower. So keep that in mind and you should be good, right? And this is also a pseudo obstruction. It's a functional obstruction caused by some kind of mutation. Diverticular disease, like it says, it's a diverticulum. And is it a true or a false one? This is a pseudo diverticulum because any sort of diverticulum is affected by the vasa recta, right? The vasa recta is basically vasculature that's given to the colon, typically it arises in the sigmoid colon, um, and there's some weak points in it. And those weak points are caused by the vasa recta, right? And it has these awkward outpouchings where like stool can get shut in there. Um, it can get its own blood supply, it, a lot of different things. It's a false diverticulum, but it only affects the mucosa and the submucosa. If you know that, you're solid. Um, this is how it looks in terms of outpouching, in terms of endoscopic kind of exploration. But um, typically it tends to be um, asymptomatic and it's caused by um, older age folks due to a poor diet and lack of proper fibers in their diet, interluminal pressure, bye-bye, right? And eventually it can become diverticulitis and itis, whenever you think of itis, inflammation, bye-bye. Okay, introduction to inflammatory bowel. What you need to know, two really important things, ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis tend to be the problematic ones. Whenever we think of older individuals, it can be either autoimmune or it can often present with um, some kind of uh, familial in inheritance pattern. But um, important to note with this is that the pathogenesis is alterations typically to the microbiota, and that can lead to several different changes. Um, and I'm going to go over all of those, but the normal kind of unifying symptoms for all of this is um, skill, sacral ileitis, right? You can have ankylosis spondylitis, which is basically your spinal body is literally fusing together because apparently they just like to hang out together and they become besties. You can have erythema nudosa, which is basically um, these kind of rash-like compositions in, the, um, in, in their foot and knees in kind of area. You can have clubbing of the fingers. Those are all kind of normal things. But remember, for seen in both CD and ulcerative colitis, which is um, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, you can have primary sclerosis cholangitis. Remember that. It's going to come back in full swing. Um, and I want to make sure you guys remember that high yield point. Crohn's disease, okay? Now, where does it like to affect? It likes to affect the terminal ileum, ileocecal valve, and the cecum. And you're like, wait a minute, I know something that gets absorbed there. It's the B12 deficiencies that often present with this um, Crohn's disease, right? So what type of pain are you going to see, right? This is where you're going to have pain that's kind of associated with these skip lesions. And whenever you see the cobblestone appearance buzzword, that's associated with Crohn's, right? These skip lesions can affect anywhere from, oops, from here to here to here and everywhere, right? It preferentially likes to do these skip lesions. So it's gonna be associated with um, 
some kind of deficiency, a vitamin deficiency, and the most common deficiency is B12, right? Cool. Make sure you guys don't switch up Crohn's versus celiac because celiac presents differently, right? Iron deficiency versus Crohn's disease, very, very more often associated with your B12, okay? Here it is, non-caseating granulomas. What if it's caseating granulomas? TB, quick and easy diagnosis. Half-hazard crypts, right? That's because it's autoimmune in nature. And remember, Crohn's is transmural, right? It's transmural, it affects everything, affects the entire layer. Ulcerative colitis, right? It's uh, typically isolated. It only likes from the, col from the rectum all the way to the colon, right? It only hangs out to this point. It doesn't go up here. There's no skip lesions. It's straight up, not a good time, right? Um, and it's a continuous linear kind of thing. So it's not like the skip lesions we see when Crohn's, okay? What is it gonna be often associated with pancolitis, right? It affects the, typically the entire colon. Extension into the ileum, it's gonna to lead to backwash ileitis. Don't worry about it because that's a presenting thing that's seen much later on. There's also inflammatory infiltrates often seen with this, very similar to Crohn's, okay? Here is the nice breakdown. I just think this is a little scary, but what you do need to know is that typically with Crohn's, it's the ileum plus or minus the colon, right? And it's the skip lesions, whereas the ulcerative colitis, it's straight up diffuse, right? It's only going to do the colon and it's from the rectum all the way to the colon, okay? Especially the top, like the bottom half of the colon, not the upper half, okay? Guess what? Um, the preferred kind of pain quadrant, right? Crohn's, what did I say? Ilium, so it's going to be the right lower quadrant area and the ulcerative colitis left, right? So, and this is really going to be important because it's going to tell you the type of presentation in terms of, painless bleeding, with bleeding, without bleeding. So um, make sure you guys go over that table. So I'm gonna go over it with you just quickly. Um, ulcerative colitis is associated with TH2 mediated damage. Crohn's disease, TH1, right? There is mucosal and submucosal in, um, in ulcerative colitis. Remember, it's kind of superficial, whereas Crohn's, right? Think of a grandma. She's very, she's, she knows everything about you. It's transmural, okay? A crony grandma, transmural, okay? Location, ulcerative colitis at the rectum all the way to the, potentially up to the cecum, but um, often it, it stays to the left quadrant, okay? So don't, don't get it twisted with the right quadrant, okay? Right quadrant pain, associate that with non-bloody diarrhea, right? Versus left, right? It's going to be associated with bloody, right? Now, in terms of crony grannies, that's how I think about the granulomas. And remember, they are non-caseating granulomas, okay? They cannot have caseations because your body isn't trying to wall this off, which is seen in TB. Now, in terms of crypts with the ulcerative colitis, it's associated with colitis crypts, right? So that's associated with increased neutrophils in these crypts. Now, the pseudopolyps are often associated with this, and that's the loss of Haustra. And the buzzword for that is lead pipe ulcerative colitis, right? Cobblestone mucosa and the string sign, Crohn's disease buzzwords, okay? If you see that in terms of your imaging study as well as your endoscopy, boom, Crohn's disease. Now, everyone likes asking about this, but apparently this is a thing. Toxic megacolon and carcinomas are more associated with ulcerative colitis, whereas more malabsorption and kidney stones and fistula formation, more so with Crohn's, okay? Calcium oxalate crystals, Crohn's. Need to know that, need to know that, need to know that, okay? All right, this is a really random, um, but if you're, if you're a smoker, you're protected against ulcerative colitis, but guess what? You can screw up your whole process by getting an increased risk for Crohn's. Seems kind of weird, but like just don't smoke and everyone's okay, cool. But both of them can lead to primary sclerosis cholangitis. Remember that guys, that one is important. Now, Infectious causes of enteral colitis, you guys know all of this, um, the classic presentation of diarrhea, abdominal pain, urgency, perianal discomfort, incontinence, hemorrhages are all bad. Now, the important thing to note is the causal agents I'm going to cover in a hot minute when we cover the um, bacterial slash any sort of your microbe section, but for now, we're going to just stick to chronic ischemic colitis. Typically, it's affecting the watershed area. Guys, remember your watershed area. Um, your marginal arteries from your superior and inferior mesenteric are coming together and it's 
supplying the left kind of flexure, right? splenic flexure. And if you if you have any sort of ischemic event, that portion on the left-hand side gets messed up. So it can mimic inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so you got to have some DDXs in mind. So now they're often insidious, kind of slower, um, and they get worse with food consumption, right? They don't get better, they get worse. Acute ischemic colitis, you guys know your E. coli species. What type of E. coli are we looking at here? That's your E. heck, right? Which is, that's your hemorrhagic E. coli, right? Associated with hamburgers and all sorts of stuff. So that's the ischemic colitis, typically the cause of it. Um, that's due to toxins and it's a transmural infarction, bloody diarrhea, right? Hemorrhagic makes sense. Um, and remember in terms of necrosis, if you can have coagulative necrosis, because remember we're talking about the actual Colon, right? Coagulative necrosis. Um, only time you're going to get liquid factor necrosis is typically in the pancreas or in the brain, right? And depend, depending on what part of the brain you're actually talking about. All right. Hemolysis and renal failure are all potential things. Let's look at malignancies or abnormal changes. Now, your hyperplastic one, you're like, wait, hyperplastic polyps, you should have increased turnover. It is epithelial proliferation, but it's decreased epithelial turnover. So your glands just are just piling up and making these goblet signs, right? Like these goblet looking kind of structures. So piling up these goblet cells and that leads to these classic kind of hyperplastic ones. Most common is the left colon because remember the left colon is actually smaller um, in terms of surf surface area. Um, and that's where mostly everything gets held in terms of fecal matter. And often it's less uh, in terms of size wise, it's pretty small. Morphological buzzword for this is tufted goblet cells, and you should be good if you know that one. All right, your hematomatous polyps, that's really important to note. Now, why do you need to know this? Is because these are actually, can be potentially associated with cancers. Now, what's a hematomatous? Okay, what's a hematoma? Okay, hematoma is basically an abnormal growth of cells in a normal place, right? They're normal cells that hang out there, but they're just like, well, I'm just gonna do my own thing. What they're in, often associated with is either a tumor suppressor or a proto-oncogene, right? Now, it can either be intestinal or extra-intestinal in terms of manifestation, but what they really care about is if you can differentiate juvenile polyp polyposis or uh, Putz-Jaeger polyposis, okay? Now, both of them are autosomal dominant because kids are a dominant force. They like to unroll everyone's life, and it's not a great time. Now, the genes associated with them is SMAD4 and BMPR1A. And you're like, wait, um, how am I going to remember that? Think of double trouble and think of the terrible twos, right? If there's two things involved, you have an increased risk for malignancy and um, literally stresses in your life. Now, if there's only one, you're okay. There's no risk, right? Now, the Putzjäger one, this tends to often trip up people. That's because they have to remember STK11, LKB1, right? I don't know why. When I was little, apparently I was into war history. So Putz Jaeger sounds like a World War II plane. So, and it's a Striker 11 type of plane model. And that's associated with World War II, Nazis, increased risk of malignancy. Okay. Yeah, apparently that's what is keeping me going nowadays. But since I told you guys it's associated with increased malignancy, what kind of malignancies? Literally everything under the sun, guys. Like I'm telling you, colon, pancreatic cancers, breast cancer, gastric, literally everything. So it's associated with SDK11, LKB1, increased risk. The juvenile polyposis tends to be not bad because remember a single lesion or sorry, a single kind of autosomal dominant change isn't bad. If it's multiple terrible twos, right? SMAD4, BMPR1A, double trouble. Okay. That's really important. Remember, these can be presented with dilated glandular kind of composition and inflammatory debris um, versus these are often smooth muscle and glandular changes, right? And whenever you're thinking of tree-like, you can think of your Putzjäger, right? Think of a bunch of Germans bombing trees and you should be pretty solid with um, Putzjäger. All right, polypsis. Now, this often kind of confuses a lot of people. Now, I like to keep it very simple with this. Tubular, right? Sounds like a Californian, very tubular dude. Um, and then tubular villus tends to be a little bit more problematic because they have sessile in nature. And villus tends to be the most problematic. Whenever you think of villus, think of villainous, right? 
villus adenomas are the villains, so they have the highest malignancy potential. Now, finally, what you need to know is that whenever you think of malignancies, think of glandular prol proliferation epithelial changes associated with greater than one centimeter or greater than two centimeter. Some people kind of go back and forth. SU says one centimeter. Everything else says two centimeters. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and villus ones tends to be the most problematic. Okay. Okay. Adamatus polyposis. And you're like, wait a minute. Adamatus polyposis. What is that? So it's, it's the colorectal cancer. It's the most common colorectal cancer, and it's associated with several different pathways. Like I mentioned, villus tends to be villainous, right? And it's the most common epithelial dis dysplasia, often seen in folks greater than 60 years of age. Buzzword, hyperchromatic in nature. Now, the pathway for this is done through two things. You can either go through the APC pathway and the buzzword or kind of mnemonic that I remember is AK53. That sounds like a gun. So, you know, guns are bad, apparently. So AK53. So that tells you the pathway of the APC that presents with the conventional adenomas. That's like the, the villus adenomas, whereas the sessile serrated adenomas, they tend to be more problematic right? That's the non-conventional, think of like serrated edges, sessile, right? Like they have like weird jagged edges. That's associated with your MSI pathway. So microsatellite instability pathway. Now you're like, wait a minute, microsatellite instability, that's associated with cancer, I know. Yes, that's associated with your Lynch syndrome, which I'm going to cover in a hot minute, right? Both of these can lead to colorectal carcinomas, um, sorry, adenocarcinomas, and that can be bad, right? The important thing that we often miss is that these sort of polypses are, they actually mess up our metabolic state. They produce a hyperproteinemic and hypokalemic state. So what are we losing? We're losing protein and we're losing potassium. That can be quite bad because that can lead to arrhythmias, um, a lack of uh, proper balancing of our osmotic oncotic pressures. So not, not a good time. Okay. Now, whenever you're thinking of your sessile, right, serrated, um, they tend to be, they actually go to the full depth, right, versus your hyperplastic, like I told you guys, those are benign, they only go in terms of serrated appearance, only one third into the crypts, that's a key distinguishing factor, don't forget it, um, they go full length for the sessile serrated adenomas, for the hyperplastic, one third. Okay, FAP. You guys know this, APC is affected. It goes through the whole pathway, APC, KRAS, P53, okay? It's APCs associated with a tumor suppressor on chromosome five, okay? 5Q, remember there's a Q arm and there's a P arm. Like you don't need to remember FTM, but like still, this is a fun cumulative knowledge. Familial often presents with teenage years. That's when you hate your family the most. And that's when um, teenage years, familial, think of it that way. That's how I remember it. And it's associated with at least a hundred polyps, often way more than that. So you're not going to be sitting there on the exam counting every single polyp because you're going to clearly run out of time, but it's associated with a lot of polyps. Okay. Whereas um, your Lynch syndrome is often associated with less polyps, less than a hundred, barely any visible, right? Um, now, often, whenever you see this, they're just going to go directly for prophylactic cholelectomy. So they're going to take out the entire colon bye-bye so that this doesn't present with um, any sort of other issues at the colon colonic level. Now, FAP can actually present um, with two other syndromes, either Gartner syndrome or Turcotte syndrome. How I remember Gartner syndrome, Turcotte rots your brain, right? Um, and I don't know why that kind of rhymes in my head. So that central nervous system involvement in terms of tumor-wise, because APC can mess with the, with the brain as well. Gardner syndrome is associated with osteomas as well as fibromatosis, right? So that's why I'm, I wanted to put in FAP, osteomas of the mandible, skull, and the bones, as well as epidermal cyst and desmoid and dental abnormalities. Okay, here it is, Turcotte. Think of turbans, apparently. This is what... Um, lovely, lovely, lovely um, AMBOSS kind of gave me. But remember, this is autosomal dominant in terms of familial, adamo, familial adamatous polyposis. Okay. All right, Lynch syndrome or her hereditary non-polyposis. And if it, if it says non-polyposis, you guys already know that this is going to be typically associated with less than 100 polyps or hardly any polyps. Remember, this is a, it's going through the irregular pathway of MSH, 
2 or MLH1, so this is the irregular pathway, um, typically the right side is affected more. So if it's the right side, it can affect a lot of different colonic levels. So it can have malabsorption of a lot of different things, typically your B12s. So think of that way. Remember, this is going to present with sessile type. Um, so it's going to be less than 100 polyps, and it can affect basically a whole bunch of other glandular structures, such as endometrium, ovary, stomach, small intestines, and biliary tract. Here is the pathway outlined for your guys' edification. I don't want to burn your guys' time too much. So let's go to the right-sided colon versus the left side. Okay. Now the right side, how I remember it is you have a right to bleed um, and you left your napkin behind. And you're like, wait, that makes no sense. Um, this is me talking to my exes. So right-sided colorectal cancer, right? You have a right to bleed because it often presents with iron deficiency anemia, microcytic hyperchromatic, a nice review of our RBC from RHS module, and it's going to present with fatigue and weakness. Whereas your left-sided is often associated with occult bleeding, right? Just occult bleeding. It's a little bit of that you see in the stool, but it's typically associated with napkin ring constriction. So you left your napkin behind at your excess place, right? It's narrow diameter because the left-sided colon is actually smaller than the right side. Um, and the important marker that we often monitor is CEA. Now, the important thing to note is that CEA carcinoembryonic antigen is only used for monitoring. It's not, it's not used for a positive diagnosis because it can actually appear in a lot of different cancers. Here's the pathway. What did I say? APC pathway, it's the traditional pathway. It can either be tubular, it can be tubular villus, it can be villus, okay? Versus MSI, often sessile serrated is associated with Lynch or HNPCC cancers. So you guys are solid on those. All right, my favorite carcinoid, um, you guys know this often, it can be presented in multiple different ways, neuroendocrine in nature. So it can be zollinger ellison syndrome. We've heard this time and time again, but it's basically a, either a pancreatic or intestinal tumor that leads to production of different um, uh, endocrine or potentially um, GIT enzymes, or um, as well as not just enzymes, but also hormones, okay? Now, carcinoid tumor especially happens in the ileal area, and they can often metastasize to the liver. And when it metastasizes to the liver, it skips the first pass effect. Then you're going to get more systemic presentation. Why do you need to know this? Is because that's when you see the actual symptoms and when patients show up to the clinic, right? They're going to have cutaneous flushing. Why? Because you guys know this. Um, your serotonin actually causes cutaneous flushing. It can also lead to sweating. Um, bronchospasms, colicky abdominal pain. Um, it can have promotile effect, right? So basically you can have a lot of uh, um, passage of stool, right? So that's due to the serotonin effect, right? And guess what you're going to find in terms of in your urine analysis, it's going to uh, find increased levels, 24 hour collection of urine, 5-HIAA, which is the byproduct of serotonin um, degradation. Okay. Cool. Um, these are the different type of presentation. The most common one that we've learned is the serotonin type. Um, but what you just need to note is that these often look salt and pepper in, in picture wise. All righty. Okay. Malt lymphomas. These are the ones you guys need to know. They're often associated with H. pylori. If you know H. pylori, you know that um, malt lymphomas, because remember there's malt and galt. And these are local lymphoid tissue that basically um, have increased turnover due to a bacterial infection that can lead to problematic changes. So boom, you know, in terms of turnover, often associated with older folks and males and typically nonspecific presentation. All righty, we're going to cover the liver. Um, like I said, med students prefer AST to ALT ratio greater than two. Um, you guys will understand very shortly why. Okay. Um, I included this picture because um, it often gives you a greater perspective of how much we've covered and what we've learned. This is a quick review of all of the anatomy of the stomach as well as the um, liver. And I also threw in a lobular kind of um, breakdown of how a, a asinar of the liver looks like. Okay. All right. Um, the important thing to note is that whenever you have apoptosis, right, you're going to have these councilman bodies. It's basically the, these squished out looking hepatocytes that are died. Okay. 
Um, the other thing that you need to note is steatosis, right? Steatosis sounds like fat. Um, steatorrhea is fat, right? Fatty stool. This is fat changes that are reversible and they can be quite important to note. Now the Mallory Dank bodies are often seen with any sort of inclusion of keratin. So Mallory Dank, they think of Mallory, this girl that really likes uh, pearls. So think of keratin pearls. Okay, so those are the important ones I wanted to highlight. Steatosis, like I said, it's fatty changes of your liver and it's not good because remember they can either be singular or multi in terms of presentation. Singular tends to be either um, a single displacement of a fat kind of droplet and it pushes the nuclear to the peripheral. Whereas multiple, think of alcoholics taking multiple shots of tequila. Alcoholics is gonna be associated with small droplets, multiple small vacuoles, right? Um, you can also have that with uh, non-alcoholic steatosis as well as from malnutrition. Now, the micro one, these are fun ones because they're associated with the fact that, you know, you're having a little one growing inside of you, which is pregnancy, acute fatty liver disease often seen in pregnancy. Ray syndrome, right? Little kids are annoying, but they're also little, so they're microvesicular. That's how I remember it. And they're associated with um, aspirin intake, typically following some kind of viral infection. Drugs and obesity and um, diabetes mellitus, all big stuff um, that are going to lead to small changes. Jaundice, my favorite. I mean, not really my favorite, but like it's it's very a hallmark presentation. So it's presented with conjugated or unconjugated bili bilirubin. It's going to lead to carnicturis, which is the deposition of unconjugated. This is really important, guys. Unconjugated bilirubin into the brain. Only unconjugated can get into the brain. Conjugated cannot, because it's already conjugated, it's already bound, it can't leave. Where does it go? It goes and gets deposited in the putamen and the basal ganglia. So this can have very Parkinson, Parkinsonian-like movements um, associated with jaundice. You can have retention of bile acids and that's dropped in the dermal layer and that can lead to skin itching, puritis, right? And then finally, you can get um, cholesterol kind of retention that can lead to xanthomas. What about differential for xanthomas? Familial, familial hypercholesterolemia also presents with skin xanthomas. And guess what? Glutamate and hepatic encephalopathies can often happen because you know you have increased deposition and the retention of um, your your nitrogenous waste, which then can get converted into increased levels of glutamate, and that can lead to hepatic encephalopathy. Here is the wonderful process of extrahepatic or prehepatic and um, intrahepatic and then posthepatic, any sort of kind of pathology that can happen. This is for your own kind of review. And remember, there's a lot of different things that can be um, affecting the liver. Something from our cumulative knowledge, um, there is Gilbert syndrome. If you guys remember, that affects those with in terms of transporting out. Um, your conjugated bilirubin. If, if Gilbert can do his job, then it, you're going to have increased levels of conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. Krigler Najjar, a quick quiz. Krigler Najjar type 1 is worse off versus type 2 tends to be a little bit better. So this is a cumulative DM knowledge. Dubin Johnson is also something you guys covered back in DM. Okay. Prehepatic, you guys know all of this, um, often associated with something increased turnover of RBCs and degradation of them, hemolytic anemia, thalassemias, hemorrhagic disorders, erythropoiesis affected due to malignancies or some other thing, post-hepatic typically, and whenever you think about it, think of gallstones. You can also have like inflammation affecting the gallbladder or even like um, inflammation of the common bile duct. Hepatic level changes tends to be either um, drugs or diffuse kind of lung kind of issues, sorry, liver issues that can lead to problematic changes at the hepatocyte level. Um, physiological ones, you guys know this one. You guys remember that UDP um, gluc glucuronyl transferase is involved in conjugating a lot of things. And when babies are born, they can actually be kind of jaundiced. And what you would do is give them non-UV light therapy to kind of um, help uh, dimerize these bilirubin that's just unconjugated and helps them excrete it out. So that's just a couple of, you know, DM knowledge review. Okay. Liver failure. Oof, this is rough. Okay. What you need to know is that liver failure is bad. Um, it can either be acute or chronic in nature. 
Um, any sort of acute hepatitis is not good um, and it can be quick onset. And that's what is basically a folamentous hepatitis. It's very quick and adverse hepatitis. It's often associated with hepatitis virus, right? Um, drug interactions, autoimmune Wilson's disease, Wilson's disease, you guys know very well, surreal plasmin deficiency. We're going to go over that. You can also have it with um, inflammation, C-reactive proteins getting messed up, Epstein-Barr virus kind of um, playing into effect. So many drug toxicity, acetaminophen can lead to this. People who pop um, acetaminophen every day due to some kind of chronic pain can have um, liver failure very quick and rapidly. Microvesicular changes often seen with Ray's syndrome or some other kind of condition, and then infiltrated disorders such as met metastatic melanomas. Melanomas love to go to the liver for some reason, um, so just keep that in mind. Okay, you guys are probably wondering, what is this giant graph? This is a densitometry meter from our term one days. It basically gives you the breakdown of all of the essential um, proteins that are secreted um, or made in the liver. I threw this in here because it gives you a kind of a nice cumulative look back at the things we've covered. Um, remember, the in terms of the, the, the liver, right, in terms of zones, there's zone one, two, and three. Zone one is the most richly perfused, and it's the one that gets often messed up with toxins. Zone two, a lot of people often forget about it, but it's associated with um, yellow fever. And zone three, it's the one that gets most likely affected by avascular events, right? Some kind of an infarct, some kind of um, lack of oxygen supply, anything can mess up zone three. So that's what you're kind of seeing here. This is due to hepatocellular necrosis caused by acetaminophen. And guess what? It looks like a nutmeg liver. Chronic liver failure is often associated, once again, with hepatitis, right? Um, typically, your B and C, right? Um, I'm, when I cover the hepatitis, you guys are going to see how I can, how you can quickly remember it. Often associated also with non-alcoholic as well as alcoholic. Okay, so what's the process by chronic liver damage? It's often due to uh, your ETO cells, and if you guys remember, ETO cells back in the day. Um, they actually store vitamin A. That's their normal function. But when life gives them a hard time um, or if they have chronic inflammation, it basically leads to fibroblastic changes of these stellite cells or ETO cells. And they're like, well, I'm going to stop storing vitamin A. I'm just going to just get angry and start um, churning out um, like fibro fibrotic tissue. So that that's typically mediated by TGF beta, right? If you guys remember, TGF beta is involved in your repair post damage. So that's why the fibrosis is seen. Or the, they've figured out how alcohol also messes with this is via acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde gets converted um, from alcohol and it's one of the intermediate pathways and acetaldehyde actually precipitates these Edo cells to actually undergo fibrosis as well. So not good. That's why we get hepato portal hypertension, hepatial cellular carcinoma. We can also get like so many other things. Portal hypertension is one of the most common things that's often associated with um, cirrhosis. And it's gonna present with all these things, hepatic encephalopathy due to glutamate typically, as well as the dep deposition of unconjugated bilirubin, um, increase of clotting factors, right? Or the decrease of clotting factors leading to bleeding. Those are their spider angiomas. Esophageal varices, guess what? We cover this again. These are painful hematemesis associated with um, the dilation of your um, torturous um, esophageal veins uh, led by the left gastric, sorry, left um, gastric vein. That's due to the portal hypertension, splenomegaly, because remember you have your splenorenal sh um, shunting as well as the connection from the liver to the spleen. Um, so keep that in mind. Remember in terms of the shunting that often sees with this. So the kidneys could be messed up with this too. Um, and then you're going to have, you know, your caput medusa. You're going to get your superficial epigastric reopening of these veins. So that's the caput medusa. Um, ascites, you're going to have testicular atrophy. Everything is just affected. It's not a good time. Now, autoimmune hepatitis is associated with very simple things, right? It sounds like what it is. It's autoimmune attack of yourself. And it's often associated with elevated IgG. And what you need to remember is being an adult is kind of lonely by yourself. It's one, right? So it's type one is associated with adults. It's anti-nuclear, right? You're not a nuclear family. So anti-nuclear affecting and then smooth muscle. Now it takes two adults, type two, um, and 
who like each other to create children. So that's type two. So that's how I remember that it's LKM. So that sounds like like them. So um, it's liver, kidney, microsomal type. That's what it stands for. And that's type two antibodies seen in children and teens. That's type two. Okay. That's how I remember the autoimmune hepatitis. Now the hepatocellular steatosis, this one's a little um, self-explanatory. It's mediated by alcohol damage. Steatosis can be reversed, whereas um, alcoholic cirrhosis cannot be reversed. All you can do is maintain it. So keep that in mind. You'll get a good understanding of it. Whenever you do your Mallory trichome kind of stain, it's associated with this chicken wire appearance. I don't know why. Apparently this is how chicken wire looks. Clearly I haven't gr grown up in a farm. I've actually seen chicken wire. It does not look like this. All righty. Not alcoholic fatty liver disease. Very simple. People aren't chugging alcohol. It's most often due to a some kind of metabolic changes, obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Basically, you're just having a hamburger every day or you have diabetes. Like that's just a very simple picture in this hand. It's gonna be associated with your serum transferases going up, right? So think about in terms of your liver being messed up, right? Your AST, ALT, ALT, ASD, depending on what type of condition you're thinking. So steatosis as well as hyalinosis is all often seen with this. So it's going to affect fibrosing around what zone? Zone three. So the central vein, zone three. Okay. Uh, primary biliary cholangitis. Okay. How this is, this is an autoimmune condition. Cholangitis is talking about the fact that the ducts in the actual liver are getting messed up. Biliary, I like to think it's like the biliary tree. So it's affecting both the small and the medium sized vessels that are draining bile. So that's why it's primary biliary, biliary uh, cirrhosis. And it's often associated with women. I like to think of a girl named biliary or Billy. And um, that's why there's a male preponderance and it's affecting mitochondria. And guess what guys? What type of people give mitochondria to babies? Mothers. So think of it as middle-aged women, right? Anti-mitochondrial antibodies, IgM-mediated antibodies. Think of all of the M's lining up for you. Wow, amazing. So it's associated with ALP and GGT being elevated because remember, this is affecting the epithelium as well as the cirrhosis. So it's going to either show up as ALT to AST being elevated as well as your ALP and GGT. Why? Because the epithelium here actually secrete ALP and GGT. Now, what if I just told you ALP was elevated? You have a lot of different differentials because ALP is associated with also bone level um, issues as well. So GGT should be the one that should clue you in that this is happening at the liver level. Morphological, it can either with show up with granulomas or without. So once again, feathery, degenerative, Mallory Dank bodies, okay? Remember, whenever you think of Mallory Dank, think of the girl who likes her keratin pearls, okay? Keratin, okay? Now, what did I tell you guys about primary sclerosis cholangitis? The important thing to note is that it's associated with often your irritable bowel syndromes, right? Um, either your Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis are all implicated in this pathway. Now, what's also associated with that it's both intrahepatic and extrahepatic presentation. So intrahepatic and extrahepatic. Make sure you guys distinguish the primary biliary sclerosis versus primary sclerosing cholangitis, okay? And this is associated with perinuclear um, anti-nuclear or p -anca for short, okay? Um, once again, alkaline phosphatase is going to be up, so keep that in mind, and buzzword onion skin um, in terms of fibrosis. Here's how it looks in all of its pretty glory. Apparently, this looks like an onion. Apparently, they haven't seen the movie Shrek because um, Shrek is like an onion. There's many layers to him. Okay. Sorry. Early 2000 references are flying through people's heads. Okay. PBC. And versus PSC, important to know, like I said, AMA, anti-mitochondrial, your mom is giving you your mitochondria. So think of a girl named Billy, her, her, she's a female, right? She's also has issues with Sjogren, how I think about it. Um, Serena Williams has Sjogren, she's a female. So fifth order connections in my brain. That's how it works. Okay. Um, PSC, like I said, often associated with male 
um, and it's associated with irritable bowel syndrome, um, as well as, you know, your Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis all involved in this. Pancreatitis is also involved in there, and this is associated with P. Anca, okay? Cool, that's it. Here is the breakdown. Sorry, like one more thing for the prime axillary one, you can also like keyword here to look on microscopy is the fluoride duct lesions, as well as the malating as well. So. Perfect. Fluoride duct lesions. See, I always forget those and Priya's got me. All righty. Let me take a quick pause on the recording. Okay, we're back. I had to take a quick pause to turn on the lights in the room. Otherwise, you guys would be staring at my Zoom video looking like a, a serial killer. Okay, okay. Let's go over this once again. So I've given you guys a nice summary table. Um, like Priya mentioned, the primary biliary sclerosis is also associated with the fluoride duct lesions and malaria dank bodies. So keep that in mind. And when you guys are going through this, associate each of them based off of um, the classic presentations and the demographics. Um, AMA for M2, which is talking about the anti-mitochondrial is associated with women. So keep that in mind. The sclerosing component is associated with men and that's P. anca. And the autoimmune hepatitis, right? This is a differential um, in terms of what can be affected. It's associated with a lot of different things. Um, make sure you guys look at the lab values for not just one system, but multi-systems, okay? All right, hemochromatosis. You're like, wait a minute, I know hemochromatosis. I've heard that name of before. Well, it's associated with HFE gene, right? It's most often inherited. It's an autosomal recessive inheritance, right? Um, and it uh, basically affects a lot of different organs, but it's associated with iron, right? Iron absorption being messed up. It's due to often like too many infusions in terms of secondary acquired version. And it can present with like micronodular cirrhosis, diabetes, because the pancreas gets affected. Um, you can get uh, abnormal skin pigmentation. That's the chromosis part, right? So like the chromatosis part. It affects men um, more often in the fifth and uh, fourth decade. Um, in life. And often women don't show up in this case, right? Because they actually get to release some of the iron imbalances due to the menses that's involved in the loss of iron that way. So men will show up sooner rather than women for hemochromatosis. Okay. So here is the overall summary, right? It's frequently genetic, autosomal recessive. It affects a whole bunch of different system, often presents with uh, uh, arthralgias, right? So like painful joints, as well as um, the HLA, right, is A3, right? And look, look, it almost looks like hemochromatosis, right? So HA3, so hemochromatosis. All right, here's what it gets messed up in terms of the actual pathway, right? Your hepcidin levels actually drop, so your ferroportins aren't working as normal, so your iron just stays in serum and starts floating around, and iron doesn't like to be floating around in serum. It, it, got, it got some problems. It got some beef to fight and a lot of different people to take it up with, so it messes up the liver. It messes up the pancreas and creates diabetes and cardiomyopathy, and whenever you take a tissue sample of them, it's going to show with Prussian blue um, staining and all these pretty, pretty blue colors. Yeah. My favorite, this is because Wilson's disease holds a near and dear place in my heart because I watch house MD a lot. And it's associated with the fact that these Kaiser Fleischer rings is one of the episodes. It's very classic. It's going to present with a lot of, um, unique kind of presentation. It affects the liver and the lungs, um, as well as potentially even the, um, uh, brain. So, uh, hepatic encephalopathy is also seen with this, and it's due to a copper um, mess up. Okay, so what happens is um, the gene that gets affected is the ATP7B gene. Um, and you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with ceruloplasmin? And I'm going to show you guys the pathway. It basically leads to the down regulation and the production of the, the multi level composition of ceruloplasmin. Um, what happens is the copper sensitivity test goes up, urine, copper excretion is also seen. There's a lot of fatty changes. There's malaria dink bodies. Remember, malaria dink bodies likes to appear in a lot of different places. Make sure you guys remember the differentials for those. Alpha-1 antitrypsin, this is important to note. It's autosomal recessive disorder, right? It's associated by the PIM, right? 14Q, 14Q, this is very important. And the heterotype verse of this, um, Heterozygotype is this is PMZ, right? And that they have mild symptoms versus the really, really bad type is the PIZZ. 
that's the piss type. And like I think like you're pissed if you have the full full blown like PIZZ homozygous mutation. Okay, so that's going to be very very problematic because what happens is your neutrophil elastase cathapsins and your proteinase three um, all get um, all essentially you know deal with the destruction of local tissue because remember elastase is one of those things that gets you know that messes up your lung astenar and uh, your alpha one antitrypsin basically down regulates it. So often elastase is the one that they like to ask about because it has both lung as well as liver kind of presentation. It can lead to, once again, hepatocellular damage due to the accumulation of misfolded proteins and then portal hypertension. It can be seen with or without gallstone involvement, a lot of different things, okay? The foconodular hyperplasia, all you need to know for this one is just straight up central scarring and it's associated with oral contraceptives. If you know that, you're solid. Um, there's low level of um, malignancy with this often, but it's just associated with central scarring and you should be good, okay? Now the cavernous hemangiomas, you're like, wait, cavernous hemangiomas, those words sound interesting. Yes, it's like basically cave-like presentations filled with blood, okay? That's essentially what it is. Um, and it's often mistaken for metastatic changes. So keep that in mind. It's just large blood filled ves vascular kind of spaces um, with kind of uh, connected tissue stromal kind of spread in between. Um, once again, it's a benign tumor, nothing too serious. Hepatic adenomas, these are a little bit more concerning, right? Because they have an increased kind of issue associated with oral contraceptives. They can also often appear with foconodular hyperplasia. Whenever we think of hyperplasia, hyperplasia doesn't have to be bad. It can, it can be malignant in nature too, though. So what are the different subclassifications? You can have mutation of the hepatocytes due to a nuclear factor one. Remember, women are involved in creating a family, so nuclear factor one, and that's often associated with rich in fat um, deposition and minimal risk for hepatocellular carcinoma. The beta catenin one, that's the one that's more problem problematic. It's often associated with men, um, and typically you have hepatocellular carcinoma type of changes, and IL-6, um, and that's associated with a little less kind of risk for hepatocellular carcinoma, but um, there is some sinusoidal dilation seen with this. Okay, blastomas, I like to think of blast as early developmental things. So they're often seen, whenever we think of blast in GIT pathology, it's often seen in early childhood. Um, they can often be associated with FAP and Beckwith-White syndrome. If you guys remember your Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, longitudinal scarring, right? throwing up alcoholics and bulimics, right? Associate those, make those connections and as well as Down syndrome, okay? Guess what? AFP is gonna be elevated. Remember alpha fetoprotein shouldn't be appearing anywhere um, after you actually become an adult. But when you're a little, if you have AFP elevation, bad, okay? Um, it's poor prognosis in general, because remember this is a blastoma. Anything that's a blastoma is rapidly proliferating and it's very angry and it wants to make new stuff, even though it's cancerous. Okay. Hepatocellular carcinoma, most common. It's literally associated with the highest incidences with hepatitis B. It's also associated with hepatitis C. Taiwan, Mozambique, China are often locations. Male have an increased preponderance of this. Um, the differential for this, how it looks, is often looks, um, or sorry, in the differentials, it can also be a fibrolaminar carcinoma. And that can be seen with variant kind of hepatocellular carcinoma. It's younger, it has like normal AFP. It's a very odd differential. It's not often seen, but alpha fetoprotein is not only just seen in one location, but it can seen in a lot of different presentation. But most op often it's seen with hepatocellular carcinoma and you can associate that right away. Women who, have, um, who are pregnant with neural tube defect babies, they can also have elevated AFP. Remember when we cover that in term one and term two. And fetal distress syndrome are often seen with AFP elevations. Remember, they can have foconodular, a lot, a lot of different massive kind of dilatory changes to the liver. And it's overall just a, not a good time. Cholangiocarcinoma, guess what? This is talking about um, the biliary tree being affected. So that's the epithelium that's lining this in this place. It's not just um, glandular structure. Guess what's associated with this? Benzidine, um, benzide, benz. Iodine, I can't say these things now. Um, nitrosamines are both are affected here. Um, 
because what they do, dyes as well as burned food are going to be problematic in how they get processed. And the important thing to note is that they're associated with the clad skin tumors. Just keep that in mind. That's a little buzzword um, to tie them together. All right, gallbladder and the pancreas. Rolling stones. That was a very poorly timed joke. Okay. Um, here is a perfect um, diagram of the anatomy of the entire, you know, gallbladder, as well as the biliary tree and ducts that are eventually going to lead to stuff draining into the duodenum. Remember, this is at the second half of the duodenum, right? This is the upper half, second half, third half, and the fourth half, right? Okay. Um, remember, this is kind of the pathway. There is the um, major papillae, and then there's the minor papillae, right? Um, any sort of cholestasis, right? A shoulder pain is often associated with this. So give me some differentials, right? Um, you can have uh, peptic ulcers that can present with left shoulder pain. Um, you can also have a uh, gallbladder issue. So not left shoulder, right shoulder pain for cholestasis. Um, a lot of different things can present very similar. So Review the anatomy and it can tell you a lot about the pathology. Okay, I hate to say it and it's not politically correct, but cholestasis is just when you have cholesterol stones or um, pigmented stones. And I'm gonna go over the different types of stones and why, why you, they're kind of important. Okay, cholestasis, especially the cholesterol type is associated with the six Fs. You're like, wait, they said four Fs in lecture. Yes, I'm gonna give you more. Six Fs is associated with fat, female, fertile, 40, fair skin, and family history. Wow. A lot more Fs. Wow. Taking all the Ls. Okay. Important things to note is that the cholesterol zones, like I said, associated with the six Fs, right? That's often associated with like a postprandial fatty meal that leads to this kind of precipitated cholesterol stones. Um, you can also have it arise due to extra hemolysis, right? Um, let's say you have a thalassemia or a sickle cell and that leads to the increased turnover. That can lead to actually black um, gallstones, right? Um, that's not good either. And finally, you can get brown um, or, or mixed kind of stones. Those often happen with the increased turnover of either, um, you know, cholesterol or black pigmented or heme or potentially even some of your, um, your WBCs. And that can lead to um, either, you know, these brown kind of stones. These aren't often seen. Most often seen is this one, right? And, and I'm telling you in terms of like overall importance. Cholestasis, right? You guys know this. Um, cholecystitis. Okay. Whenever you think of cholecystitis, think of inflammation. Most often cause is due to a gallstone complication, but you can also have ischemic because the cystic artery doesn't have any collateral blood supply. And literally, if you have some, some sort of hyperperfusion, boom, your, your biliary tree, as well as your bile duct and your gallbladder are like, I'm angry now. I'm just going to get irritated. And, and then boom, inflammation. Okay. Chronic cholestasis is often associated with more so a bacterial or maybe even like a gallstone maybe playing into this. Um, differentials, what you do need to know um, is that often a microorganism gets superimposed on these An E. coli species can hang in there. You can even have um, the bu very buzzwordy statement of a porcelain gallbladder. Whenever you see the porcelain gallbladder, boom, you're taking out their gallbladder. It's going, it's by, okay? But whenever you're thinking of your gallbladder, the buzzword you often should think about is the rakitansky ashkoff sinuses. Those, whenever you have a gallbladder um, issue, it's where the actual inflammatory components hang out. So inflammation often ha happens in these pseudo outpouchings. So keep that in mind and you should be solid. And finally, remember Murphy's sign for this. Remember any sort of uh, gallbladder issue, Murphy's sign. Boom, you're solid. You poke down on their right upper quadrant and you pray to God that they don't take an inspiratory halt. Um, that just is a positive sign that you're gonna have to take out their either gallbladder or give them a whole bunch of anti-inflammatories and uh, antibiotics. Okay, carcinomas are often associated with um, of the gallbladder with females and they're typically older females. And you're like, wait a minute, why older females? It's also associated with um, postmenopausal, right? Estrogen, if they're on estrogen supply or um, hormone replacement therapy, this can actually affect um, the, the overall kind of turnover of cells in the gallbladder. 
like a lot of things, oral contraceptives can be kind of challenging, and that can lead to um, potential superimposed infections of the biliary tract, okay? Mostly adenocarcinomas, because remember, like everything else in the GIT, there's a lot of glandular tissues, okay? Biliary tree disease. What did I tell you guys in terms of important lab value? ALP, GGT. If you know that, solid, 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 okay? Um, it's often associated with um, GGT more so because it's more specific, okay? It's either intrahepatic or extrahepatic in nature. Um, extrahepatic um, can either be a, a stone or a cholangitis. Remember your PBC versus PSC, all of those are coming back in full swing. Cholidolicolithiasis, that sounds like a, like a made up word, but it's actually just a similar pathology to a gallstone. It's when a gallstone blocks it, and most often it's the common bile duct involved. So if you think of this very long word as associated with the common bile duct often being involved, and the, it's involved with the Mirazi um, syndrome, and that's typically due to, um, caused by cystic um, gallstone impacting the cystic duct, causing a compression of the hepatic duct and obstruction and jaundice, right? Typically with gallstones, lab value is going to be increased conjugated bilirubin. And whenever you're thinking of cholangio cholangiotitis, right? In, ter in terms of your buzzwords, think of your Charcot's triad, fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice, right? Remember, often associated with recurrent cholangitis, cholangitis which is associated with your Chinese liver fluke, which we're going to cover in your arm micro section. Okay. Cystic fibrosis, very simple. You guys know this since the dawn of time. Autosomal recessive, it can present with liver um, pathologies, pulmonary pathologies, pancreatic pathologies, all combined. Okay. If you know that, you're solid. Think of seven heaven. That's how I remember cystic fibrosis, seven heaven. Um, CFTR gene gets messed up. Um, and remember, these are the ones with salty babies. These babies are salty. I don't know why, but apparently it has to do with the ENAC channels and the fact that sodium and chloride get to hang out in the sweat glands outside and they can't be brought back in. So just a bunch of salty babies. I totally feel it. That's how I feel about DERS. Okay. Um, defective, right? Salt concentration is very high. Um, pancre pancreas gets messed up. They can have um, lack of proper sperm production. They're going to have a difficult time passing the meconium. So the baby isn't getting the meconium out, which is the first poop. Um, that doesn't happen. So basically everything is just not having a good time. Okay. Acute pancreatitis, very simple. Um, often it's associated with either a gallstone or it's associated with alcoholism. Very simple. If you know those two differentials, you have a good understanding of acute pancreatitis. Now, you're probably wondering, why are the alcoholics being thrown in here? Why are the alcoholics always targeted? It's because when alcohol is consumed at high levels, it can lead to um, increased activation of the proenzymes, right? These are your these are the zymogens who haven't been fully activated, like your trypsinogen. Um, and remember, trypsinogen is the main one that basically goes and activates everything else. So if that gets activated early on, it's going to start destroying all of the things around it. So it's going to present with acinar cell damage. It can also mess up the cellular tissue or intracellular kind of um, function of normal um, pancreatic tissue. Right. Remember, these are exocrine functions. We haven't gotten to the endocrine kind of component of this. Cool. Okay. Um, very important to note, uh, when you're thinking of your pancreas, when it gets affected, it's going to be A before L, right? Your amylase levels rise first, then your lipases, right? Amylase first, A before L. Remember, it can present with a lot of different things in terms of clinical feature of your pancreatitis. It can lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute tubular necrosis, pancreatic abscess, and you're like, wait, that's a lot of different functions. Why is that happening? Because um, this wasn't actually explained in lecture, but I wanted to give context to it, is we can get pleural effusion um, and severe pancreatic inflammation that leads to lymphatic obstruction at the diaphragm level. The fluid accumulates in the in the actual diaphragmatic region, and that causes irritation, and that leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome and the lack of proper lung, lung inflation leading to the presentation that you're seeing here. Okay, chronic pancreatitis. Guess what? Who's back? Your ETO cells, not really, but your proliferative stellite cells, there are also stellite cells in the pancreas 
they often um, lead to increased proliferation and they become fibroblastic in nature and add more collagen and other kind of fibrous deposition. And that leads to pan pancreatic fibrosis, often associated with long-term alcoholic usage, right? Um, and it's either, it can be either autoimmune or hereditary, but most often it's alcoholic induced. Middle-aged men are more affected because, you know, middle-aged men have more, I guess, problems in their life than women. Who, who would have thought? Yeah. Shake my head. All right. Pancreatic adenocarcinomas. Guess what, guys? Trousseau syndrome. Remember, migratory thrombophlebitis may be present with this. And the specific marker we should be concentrating on this is CA199. Okay. Important to know that. Important to know that. Um, it's the fifth most common cause of death. Um, Steve Jobs actually had this kind of diagnosis. It's quite painful. It often affects the pancreatic head and it blocks it. And all of the stuff that we had talked about, about how you're going to have auto activation of these zymogens and the destruction, it's going to be quite painful in terms of pancreatic pain. So think of pancreatic pain, right? Pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia, pain, right? Pan in, I like to think of it as pain. Okay. So the mutations involved, KRAS, CDKN2A, and TP53, right? Always think of your TP53 as the last line thing, holding everything together. It falls apart, but KRAS is the first one implicated, okay? Specific marker, like I mentioned, need to know Cal a CA199, okay? My favorite, insulinomas, guys. What are we looking at with insulinomas? They're basically a type of zollinger ellison syndrome, right? Um, zollinger ellison syndrome is just a broad classification of multiple different things that can actually um, happen in terms of a abnormal growth. Typically, insulinomas affect the beta cells, right? This is endocrine in function. It's going to lead to fasting hypoglycemia. They can literally chuck a little piece of sugar in their mouth and that it'll be gone in seconds. It's going to be low blood glucose. They're going to pass out all the time because there's not enough going to the brain. Insulin level is going to be increased. And this is endogenous insulin, right? So their C peptide levels is actually going to be elevated as compared to sulfonylureal drugs, which we're going to cover um, week four of DERS. Okay. Gastronomas are quite bad because they can be in a lot of different locations. They can be at the duodenum, peripancreatic tissue, hypergastronemia. Why do we not want gastronemia? We don't want gastrin because gastrin stimulates the stomach and everything else to produce a whole bunch of hydrochloric acid. And we want our hydrochloric acid to be neutralized when it comes down to the intestinal level. So the most common implicated thing is zollinger elson syndrome, multiple duodenal peptic ulcers, predominant gastric rugae um, proliferation due to um, kind of glandular proliferation, steatorrhea, all of them can be implicated. And men's syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia, men one, affects all of the P's, guys, because remember it affects the pancreas, parathyroid, and what else? Pancreas, parathyroid, and what else? pituitary. There you go. All the P's. So think of all of your P's being affected, pancreas, um, pituitary, or parathyroid, and um, pituitary. There we go. I am clearly confabulating. All right. We're going to start getting into micro. We're going to take a quick five minute break before I lose my voice and chug some water. All righty, we're back. I chugged some water and hopefully if I lose my voice halfway through, Priya's got me. So um, let's do this thing. We're gonna cover micro. There's a whole bunch of different viruses, pathologies, and very similar things that we've seen. Um, but with the differentiating factors, I'm gonna try to outline kind of going through this. I threw these two in here because I think it helps with the whole mental map and arrangement of everything from your gram positives to your gram negatives, because um, first days does always a, does a good job of outlining the high yields and what the essential wants to know in terms of oxidase positive, oxidase negative. Remember all of your Campylobacter, Vibrio cholerae, and Helicobacterial are all oxidase positive. So that is a good kind of like, you've just captured a good chunk of the virus or sorry, bacteria that we've covered um, in the micro section of this module. So let's start out um, nice and easy, very simple, candidiasis, right? This is a um, HIV slash AIDS defining uh, disorder, right? Um, and specifically a micro uh, invasion. 
Candidiasis is actually seen in several different places. It's actually seen in the reproductive tract, um, typically with females. This is like the second most common cause of um, urinary tract infections as well as, as well as vaginal vaginosis. Oof, I can't pronounce words today. Um, but here we're looking at specifically in terms of the esophagitis that it, it causes, right? And remember the differentiating factor between candidiasis and um, leukoplakia is that candidiasis can actually be scraped off versus leukoplakia, you cannot, right? And remember, this is a opportunistic pleomorphic um, organism, it will basically look like cottage cheese when you're kind of like doing your endoscopy and you can take it out very easily. And there's typically um, some bleeding, but overall it's not as bad as leukoplakia, which you literally have to just biopsy in order to take out. Okay. Often associated with organ transplant, immunosuppression, diabetes, immunosuppression is also involved with diabetes, antibiotic usage, polymorphic yeast, pseudohyphae bud. Okay. So keep that in mind and you should be solid. HSV, guess what, guys? Um, it's the herpes simplex virus, and this is the one that often gets implicated in um, apath apothecaries um, ulcers, or I'm, I'm probably butchering that, but it's, it's the oral ulcers that we often see, um, and it often gets reactivated. It's, it, it tends to establish itself, and it can often come up again with in terms of uh, reactivated viruses in terms of immunocompromised states. It doesn't just have to be in, like, sick sick patients when like HIV AIDS kind of situation. It can also be due to stress. Um, so if you can get it like a little um, a canker sore, like in the, in terms of your um, lips, those often can be associated with HSV-1 as well. Now, biology of it, it's part of the herpes spiridae. So large enveloped and DS DNA. So that means the replication happens where? In the nucleus. So it's a latent infection. Often um, it doesn't really have too many virulence factors going for it, but in terms of what it does in terms of your esophagus, um, esophagitis is um, these well, -circum well circumscribed volcano-like appearance. And that's a lot of mouthful, but like what you need to just remember with this is that it straight up looks like hole punches in the um, esophagus. So that's the kind of like the buzzwordiness of it. Um, and you should be good in terms of that. Um, we've actually seen cytomegalovirus before, but we haven't spent too much time covering it. The important thing to note is that it's once again immunocompromised and tends to affect um, in the lower esophageal area. Um, commonly seen in AIDS defining feature, right? Just like candidiasis, as well as your HSV. Um, and it, typ it typically sees um, its kind of appearance up here when you have these um, uh, like longitudinal lesions. So the differential diagnosis for longitudinal lesions is your Mallory Weiss, or it can be your cytomegalovirus, um, typically depending on what the population slash age and demographic of the patient is. Once again, large envelope DSDNA virus part of the same, uh, same herpes viride family. Um, remember, it's a lifelong latent infection. It basically loves to hang out in monocytes, granulocytes, and lymphocytes. It just likes to hang out there. It can present with a lot of systemic changes, like um, you can have a nervine deafness, sensory neuronal deafness in, uh, in kids. It's a leading cause of it, actually, in developed countries. And it can also present with seizures. It can have a lot of effects on um, your, your central nervous system and your brain. So that's all going to be covered in term five. So in terms of a quick summary, cottage cheese appearance, think of your candidiasis, CMV flat, um, longitudinal kind of lesions. Remember CMV, HSV, it's like hole punch lesions on the esophagus. Okay. A, B, C, and outline nicely. My favorite, because we spent literally way too much time learning it, Helicobacter pylori. Remember, it's very simple in terms of its Ba um, bacterial profile. It's gram negative, curved. Um, I like to just call it spiral because it makes life simple. It's uh, motile. It needs to be motile so that it can hang out in the antrum. And remember, because your gastric fluids are constantly moving around, it's microaerophilic. So it can deal a little bit of oxygen and mostly carbon dioxide. It's oxidase positive. So it's in the same family or group of your Campylobacter jejuni, as well as several others, um, as well as your Vibro species. And it's urease positive. And the urease positive fact is the one that's really darn important because you can actually get a super infection with Helicobacter pylori, with Salmonella, with your Vibro cholera. So many different things are, are all preferential for you lowering your stomach um, pH or sorry, increasing your stomach pH and making it more basic that um, they can then hang out there and cause infections. 
virulence factors, they have adhesion factors. So the BABA and SABA, um, that's really important. They have the flagella to stay motile and then urease. Your urease is actually really important because it actually helps you identify them. That's the urease breath test. Remember, if you give them a proton pump inhibitor, it's actually going to be um, problematic because you can test for ongoing infection with Helicobacter pylori once you give them proton pump inhibitors. Um, remember, the gastric acid actually becomes more basic, not uh, acidic. Okay, and it has a type four secretion system, and it, it messes with the gastric mucosa and does a whole bunch of things. And remember, it's gram negative; it has your LPSs, and that tends to be problematic. Okay, in terms of Oncogenesis, um, this can lead to gastric adenocarcinoma, often associated with your CAGA. Um, I like to think of your cage A gene, um, and that gene is associated with increased ulcers as well as cancers. So quite bad. Um, in terms of exotoxin, it's your VACA, which is your VACA. That's associated with, you know, um, vacular swelling, mitochondrial death, apoptosis, and all of that jazz. Okay. Let's look at bacterial peritonitis very quickly. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is often associated with alcoholics, right? Ascites, E. coli species, your non streptococci, pneumonia, and your Klebsiella pneumonia. Those are all implicated and really important ones to know. Pancre pancreatitis ones are very simple. Think of your drugs, think of your bacteria. Most often it's your Coxsackie viruses, which are gonna cover later on, your cytomegalovirus and your mumps. So think of your, um, you know, your classic mumps presentation. It's gonna be associated with elevated um, lipases, sorry, amylases levels, amylases, sorry. Um, keep that in mind because it can affect the, both the parotid glands as well as the um, pancreas in terms of mumps infection. Appendicitis, very common, very buzzwordy heavy. You just need to know appendicitis, E. coli, or, um, or your fragilis, your bacillus fragilis kind of uh, one species. Okay, my favorite, the other one from your this section, aside from Helicobacter pylori, is C. diff. Uh, very, 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 very often seen in the hospital situation because it's nosocomial. Um, typically, you just give your patient a whole bunch of clindamycin, right? If you give them a whole bunch of clindamycin for like extended periods of time trying to fight off something, yeah, C. diff is just going to invade and have a grand old time because it's a gram positive anaerobic bacillus and it loves following, forming these endospore um, and it's motile. So it has really two important virulence factors, toxin A and toxin B. Both of them cause um, these pseudomembranous colitis, which is what is kind of outlined here, these like little giant protruding thingamabobs. And that can be quite bad because um, essentially they can be reversed upon like you stopping this. Um, but the important thing in terms of knowing this is that they do cause this appearance and that can kind of um, give you a lot of different differentials to work with, like from ulcerative colitis, um, to several other conditions that look very similar. It could even be candidiasis, depending on if you like read the endoscopic wrong. Um, so what do you do in terms of identifying? You can do your NAAT. Um, it's not very specific. Your ELISA, or sorry, ISA for glutamate dehydrogenase test and um, EIA for your toxin A and B. That's the important thing to know. Remember your toxin A is your enterotoxin and then your cytotoxin is the one that's messing with um, inside the cell, right? Cool. Um, here are just a quick kind of breakdown of your exudate inflammatory diarrhea versus um, secretory diarrhea. Secretory, think of most often just secreting out water or some kind of osmotic disturbance. Whereas your exudate, think of your typically your immune system involved in it. So you're going to have um, mucosal um, wastage as well as your leukocytes found in the stool. So blood and leukocytes, very buzzword heavy. If you know that, you should be solid. All right, pathogenesis, I broke it down here. This is the really key differentiating factor. If you know this, you're solid. ETEC versus EPEC is what we're going to cover next. These are your E. coli species. They're your gram-negative bacilli rods. So they are part of your enterobacterial species. And remember, there's it's a big family. They have your Escherichia species, which are your E. coli. No one says Escherichia because like ain't nobody got time for that. Um, Shigella, Salmonella, 
um, your Cena, which is associated with your bubonic plague, remember from RHS, um, your Klebsiella species, as well as your protease. We haven't covered Klebsiella and protease in depth, but just it's important to note regardless. It's a facultative anaerobe, right? So it can switch over to an anaerobic situation because it's a lactose fermenter. It can ferment a lot of different things and stay alive. Um, and the important thing is that it causes so many different diarrheal presentations because the e. e. coli species is quite extensive. The way I remember the E. coli antigenic structures is OKH, right? And the little mnemonic I have or like little saying is, oh, shit, it's LPS Helga capsula. So that's just a very, I don't know why it stuck with me. I found it on Anki. I thought it was ingenious. So I was like, I'm going to incorporate it into my lifestyle. So the important thing is that um, they have several different virulence factors. It's not just this um, kind of like a, associated with the O, K, and H com components. Um, they also have a pili, and it's the most leading cause of, um, if you guys remember back to your urinary tract infections, the pili are the ones that likely cause the UTI. And um, that's kind of like a nice, when did we cover that? RHS, maybe um, CR. Yeah, CRS. Yeah, we covered in CRS. And the important exotoxin components that we need to know solid is the LT and ST, right? Um, and we're going to cover those very quickly. So your heat labile toxin is associated with cyclic AMP. The way I remembered it is that when you're traveling in LA, so LA is labile, so and then A is for adenyl cyclase, so LA. And then you're going from LA to San Gabriel, which is like a different location in Mexico. Cause that's Mexico. There's like San Gabriel. Cause it sounds like very Hispanic. Okay. So please don't hurt me in the comment section. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, the S the stable component, the heat stable component of the exotoxin. It deals with the guanine cyclase. So you're going from LA to Mexico and that's the traveler's diarrhea. So that's like a nice quick way to tie this information together. And I gave you guys a little saying to keep it straight. Cool. Your EPEG, um, think of the P for, even though it's like pathogenic, um, just think of it for your peds. Remember the peds, it's kind of like a image, it's kind of like an immature bacteria. It doesn't have your ST and your LT and your colony stimulating, oh, sorry, your colonizing factor agents, right? So all it has essentially is your BFP, which is your bundle of joy pili because children are a bundle of joy, right? Um, so BFP, so bundle forming pili, which basically causes attachment and that causes malabsorption, causes the watery di diarrhea in kids. So that's the childhood diarrhea. So BFP, bundle of pili. So that's how I remember it. It's a very kooky way of remembering, but hopefully it helps you. Vibro coloring, right, is a your gram negative. It's an oxidase positive. This one's really important, guys. Um, because remember, your oxidase positive species, you guys have to have down cold for your differentials. Remember, your E. coli versus Vibro cholerae tend to look very similar in how they clinically present. So E. coli is oxidase negative. Vibro cholerae is oxidase positive. Key defining feature. They both have motile components, though they look very similar. So keep that in mind. Vibro cholerae associated with the rice water stool, and you should be solid. Now, the important thing with this is that it can lead to a lot of systemic um, issues because of how perfused the watery diarrhea is. Dehydration, hyponatremia, hypocholeremia, metabolic acidosis are very quickly seen with your cholera toxin, okay? Know that that it's phage encoded. It's actually a, a, a common species that tends to hang out in a lot of um, parts of the world, such as India. I've seen cholera time and time again back in um my days when I was there. It's acid sensitive. So think about it this way. If you give a patient a proton pump in inhibitor, or if you give the patient, or hopefully you're not giving your patients H. pylori, but like if they have H. pylori, um, they can also be quickly susceptible to your vibro cholerae species. So um, because you've changed your stomach acid uh, composition, right? Now it's more basic. It can quickly get um, brought in and cholera can quickly settle in very quickly. Okay. Halo tolerant. So this is really important because salt water um, regions can be quite often affected with this, with your vibro cholera. That's why India is often associated with the salt water kind of 
you know, foods and anything of that, of that nature, depending on how the water is kind of maintained. So keep that in mind. And remember, your cholera toxin uses very similar kind of um, methods in terms of how it stimulates GS, right? So it's cyclic AMP. Keep that in mind. Your LT, your um, labile toxin of your E. coli also uses GS. So cool. Let's do, oh, well, I already told you guys the oxidase um, negative versus positive. So keep that in mind. Um, remember, TCBS is a special for the cholera species. So keep that in mind. Um, it, it, when we cover the parahemolyticus versus the vernacularis, your cholera species will actually um, turn yellow, right? That's the important thing. TCB on this agar, it will turn yellow because it actually messes with the sugar. Um, whereas your sucrose negative species are your parahemolyticus versus your vernacularis. I just threw in the, the cholera kind of vaccination. I remember like hearing and seeing that my mom has told me about the cholera drops that they used to give. These are live attenuated vaccines, guys. They're not given to everyone and you don't typically give it to anyone less than 18 because their immune system aren't set in so they can have a lot of um, problems with any sort of live attenuated vaccines. C. diff, woohoo. Okay, um, we've heard this time and time again, right? C, not C. diff, but C. perforingis is, is very different, okay? It's gram negative, large anaerobic, right? Remember, all your clostridium is anaerobic, okay? Non motile, because remember, your C. diff is motile. Um, it is a spore former, like the other species that we've encountered, and they typically are found in intestinal forms of your humans as well as other animals. And they're very, very common. And a nice review of that is the Clostridium perforingis causes gas gangrene um, from FTCM days, okay? And it's a type A foodborne infection. It has the CPE slash LT toxin. It has a cytotoxic activity. It messes with the intestinal kind of lining as well as it, it creates the positive cyclic AMP action that we saw. Um, similar to your enterotoxin that we associated with your E. coli, as well as your um, Clostridium species. Okay, whenever you think of your Bacillus cirrus, either think of your two differentials. It's either a food-borne pathogen um, or a food poison, okay? Uh, you got to know the B Bacillus cirrus cold in terms of these two kind of presentations. Regardless, this the Per, like the overall appearance and the pathological nature of it is very similar because it's a gram positive rod. It's arranged in chains. It's aerobic, right? Think about, you got to cook rice in some air, right? Like, it, you know, the steam rises when you cook rice. That's how I remember that it's associated with rice and um, it's aerobic, okay? It's spore former, just like your Clostridium perforingis. Um, and it is has two toxins, right? Emetic toxin and enterotoxin. Emetic, think about e hematemesis or emetesis, which is basically throwing up. Um, so keep that in mind. It's often found in basically everywhere, but it's going to act very similar to your LT toxin that it's going to mess with the cyclic AMP, elevating the levels, more um, kind of release of your diarrheal component and leading to watery diarrhea. Emetic component, very short. It's very quick. You're going to throw up right away. And that's kind of very similar to your ST slash your neurotoxin. It's heat stable. So keep that in mind. Um, you cook rice in hot temperatures and then you put it out in the fridge for long periods of time. So think about it that way. Heat stable. So cool, cool, cool. Now your norovirus, my favorite, because um, literally you go on a cruise ship, boom, you get this. Like um, as long as you're not eating shellfish or like if you don't eat shellfish or anything like that, you're, you're solid, um, which I don't, but it's still very quickly transmissible because um, it's literally, it can appear even in small groups. Um, children are, are most often affected with this. Think of like a California cruise. Um, so that's like the Calci Verde. I like to think of California Calci Verde. Uh, there's a lot of different viruses in this group. It's a small, non-enveloped icosahedral nucleocapsid, right? Think about it that way. It's small, it's tiny, it's quickly spread, and it's in close proximity, also called Norwalk virus back in the day. And the pathogenesis is quite simple, right? It's fecal oral route, waterborne, typically raw shellfish, if you're eating like freshwater seafood. Um, and typically microvilli get blunted. Yeah, how I like to think about it is no more villi, right? Like norovirus, no more villi. So 
I don't know why that sticks in my head, but that's how I keep it straight. Rotavirus is basically a combination presentation. It's your rheovirus family, so respiratory, endo, enteric, and orf, uh, orphans, um, which sounds very depressing to think about. Um, just thinking of like sad orphans just throwing up and just diarrhea everywhere. Um, but what you do need to know is that um, it's a wheel shaped. It's part of your segmented DS RNA. It's a DS double stranded RNA species. So very important. It has multiple structures and layers to it. Um, and the two important thing to know with that is that it has a G antigen and a P antigen that is used to identify it, which is the glycoprotein versus the protein sensitive um, components. And you should be solid because all it does is it causes villous blunting, once again, like your norovirus. Um, and if they're blunted and you're having destruction of your villi, you're going to get malabsorption, you're going to get osmotic imbalances, and boom, diarrhea. Literally everyone in this module just vomiting or not having a good time. Okay. Finally, what I wanted to mention with this is blunting, right? And there are a couple of vaccines for it. It's not often given because of the fact that um, it causes intersections. Remember, those are like your sausage-like masses. It often happens at the ileocecal junction because it's a narrowing point and it's a very compromised location between your intestines, um, small intestines to your large intestines. So keep that in mind, intersections, ileocecal junction, very, very, um, there is the Rotec, there's the um, Rotrix and the Rota shield is no longer used. That's the discontinued one. Bye-bye. Um, okay. So this is given at the second month of when the baby's born. Okay. It's live attenuated vaccine. So you can imagine why it's so important that we give this to the patient, um, especially young kids, because this you don't want them to develop a severe diarrhea and go into a metabolic acidosis. Okay. Astrovirus. Okay. It's a very simple virus. Its family is the Astroviridae small, think of like asteroids hurtling towards earth. It's non-enveloped because asteroids don't have a shield on them. They're naked and smooth um, in terms of how they appear. They might have slight indentations, but it's a positive sense SSRNA virus. Okay. Very simple, very similar to um, how they appear in the norovirus right there. They, they often peak in winter. And they don't really have too many crazy things going for them, like the adenovirus, because the adenovirus, we've seen it time and time again. We've seen it in the respiratory system. We've seen it in the GIT system. And it's a icosahedral protein um, kind of, remember, it's not like a naked, it's a naked virus. It's a DSDNA. And it can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. It can cause conjunctivitis. So many things that we've covered in RHS in terms of adenoviridase. Okay. Nice cumulative review of what they can do, but once again, diarrhea with or without vomiting. Most of the time, it's just diarrhea. All right, your cryptosporidium. Guys, cryptosporidium, telling you, this is another AIDS-defining feature. It's often associated whenever your CD count goes down. This is something that we're going to cover when we cover the respiratory, uh, not respiratory, the reproductive um, portion of our module. Typically, um, whenever you're doing the zeal Nelson, you're going to see your ovocytes. I threw this in here because it was covered early on, but what you need to know that the two species associated with them is that crypto, Cryptosporidium parvum and homininesis, and basically it's a protozoa, right? It's a self-limiting diarrhea, but it can be bad in people who have AIDS. It's a, another AIDS defining. So if you have that down, you should be good. Your listeria species. Now, what's happening with listeria? So it's basically your, whenever you hear of tumbling motility, boom, listeria, okay? It's a very heavy buzzword. It's a gram-positive facultative intercellular. Why? Because it uses the inside um, mechanisms, um, inside the intercellular mechanisms to basically move around from one cell to the other um, in terms of the, the polymerization of different chains and leading to from cell to cell kind of jumping around. It's gram positive, right? Like I mentioned, it's going to be actually beta hemolytic. So keep that in mind. And remember tumbling motility, it looks like a rocket and you should be good. And it's the only species that produces an endotoxin. It's not a true endotoxin, but it's an endotoxin nevertheless. And that causes the watery diarrhea that we've seen thus far. All right, Shigella. Okay, so this is also your gram negative, right? It's a differential diagnosis when you think of your gram negative species. 
Remember, it has two, I mean, it has several different kind of virulence factors, but the important thing to note is that um, it's non-motile, right? It's shigella, right? It, it doesn't sound like salmonella. Salmons can swim and they're acid stable. So think about it this way. Acid stable is for shigella. Um, and that's very important. That's an important thing to know because since they're acid stable, they can quickly enter the system even if you have a normal functioning um, stomach, okay? They're closely related to E. coli, right? And how they look. So differentials have to be solid. Food, flies, feces, and fingers, four Fs, need to know those cold. Um, the most common type is Shigella Sony. Um, Sony E, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, but it's associated with your O antigens, right? Your O antigens are used to classify them. And remember, O is talking about your LPSs. So keep that in mind and how like the outer kind of composition of it is. So it produces the exotoxin, the Shiga toxin. It's very similar. The only other species that produces Shiga-like toxin is your E. coli hemorrhagica, which is associated with your um, bloody diarrhea, which we're going to cover in a bit. Um, it also destroys all of the NAD in the human cells, leading to the shutdown of the metabolism. So it can be quite severe in nature. Um, and the Shiga toxin, how it works is basically by going into the individual cells and basically binding to the 60S. If you guys remember your 60S ribosomal subunits, um, in terms of your eukaryotes, it's 60S and 40S make up 80S, right? That's your nice cumulative FTM review of, of ribosomes and their subunits. And that can lead to the classic presentation and the death of cells and the microvascular damage, as well as hemorrhagic kind of blood and fecal leukocytes in the stool. So keep that in mind. This can be either diarrhea that's watery, or it can be acidic or not acidic, but it can be bloody in nature. So, and the often buzzwordy thing associated with them is can see, can pee, can climatry because you get arthritis as well, urethritis and conjunctivitis. And the species that are often implicated with this is Shigella, Salmonella, Yersinia, and your chlamydial species when we cover it later on. Okay, special agar that we need to know. Remember, um, it can be either... Um, well, remember when you do your McConkey, all you're trying to do is find out if they're lactose pause, if they can ferment lactose or if they can't ferment lactose. Um, so it's going to be pale and colorless because it makes sense. They're not lactose fermenters. You're, they have a special kind of agar. They have your Salmonella Shigella agar and um, they have your eosin metho methylene blue agar. So in that, they're actually going to be, um, they're going to be very unique in that they, they do have your H2S kind of fermenting capabilities. Whereas your, when you guys, when we cover E. coli more in depth, you remember your EMB is actually turned green for your E. coli species. So it's a lactose non-fermenter, citric acid neutralizer is also not, it's also negative and H2S is also negative um, in terms of production. Okay. Continuing on our E. coli journey, it's gram-negative, rod-shaped, motile, facultative, anaerobic, non-spore forming. You guys know all of this. Now, the important one that we're going to cover is this one, O157H7. That's going to be your hemorrhagic species. That's very important. It's going to cause bloody diarrhea. So keep that one solid in the back of your head. It, it, okay. When we cover this, think of the A for aggressive, so entero-aggressive version of this, that one has a very unique thing. That unique thing is the presence of this um, aggravative adhesive fimbrate, okay? That fimbrate causes actually bloody diarrhea and it doesn't use anything else and it binds in terms of how it enters via mucin-1 um, epithelial cells. Like that's the special receptor that it uses. Now the Shiga toxin producing one or STEK, now for my European counterparts, we use EHEC. That's the one that I prefer to use because it tells you exactly what's happening with the bacteria. But STEC is what America uses. So yeah, we're Mr. Worldwide. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, how it how how it has its kind of like very serious effects is via the STLT or your Shiga-like toxin producing factor. And that's associated with specifically, now think about it. You have to have it pretty bad in your life to be associated with one specific break um, breaking point. Jack in the Box was the first place it was identified. So thank you, Jack in the Box, for contributing to E. coli science and um, for, for forever associating your, your name with E. coli. So, wow, their marketing campaign must have had a nightmare with that. Okay, um, 
STEC, remember, it's going to have three really important presentations. It can cause hemorrhagic colitis, right? Like, remember when I mentioned that this can be quite severe because it's bloody diarrhea. Leukocytes are going to be found in the blood. There are going to be hemolytic uremic syndromes. And this typically happens in, in, like, in a bimodal distribution. Children or older um, individuals that tend to get this. Children, most often, microangiopathic hemolytica, thrombocytopenia, acute renal failure. Very common. HUS, they call this. Um, HUS presentations, and then thrombo, thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura. These are often seen, like, like I told you guys, bimodal kind of presentation, elderly, okay? Right, right off the bat, like I told you guys, it's associated with cytotoxic kind of presentation. All you need to know in terms of how we kind of culture and identify it, McConkie, Remember, this doesn't do sorbitol, right? It doesn't do any sorbitol. Your STEC um, is just not going to do any sorbitol McConkie, but it will do regular McConkie. It's going to still do lactose fermenting. ELISA, you can still do in terms of how, in terms of antibodies, but um, the very important thing is it's going to present with schistocytes. So if you think of some kind of hemolytic anemia, sorry, not hemolytic anemia, hemorrhagic colitis combined with um, schistocytes in the um, blood smear, as well as bloody diarrhea, you now have a classic presentation of your STEC or EHEC um, E. coli species. All right, salmonella. Um, this is quite bad because salmonella um, is has a lot of different kind of presentation. Salmonella has two big main classification. You have your typhoidal and paratyphoidal, and they sound like they where they're going to go and affect. Like I'm telling you, it's quite simple as they sound. They're going to affect the thyroid, and they're going to affect the parathyroid. Um, and when we cover those later on, you're going to understand those a little bit better. Um, and what we need to know is the non-typhoidal ones cause gastroenteritis, food poisoning. Very simple, very straightforward. And what we remember from Shigella versus Salmonella is that Shigella is non-motile versus Salmonella. Remember, salmons can swim, so they are going to swim. So they're going to swim. They're gram-negative rods, do not ferment lactose, and they're motile. Okay. Once again, they have their O antigen. They have the H antigen, right? Think of the flagellar. And then they have the capsular virulence factor. Now, your S Typhi and S. paratyphi are only passed through fecal oral and they're only human reservoirs, right? They don't go through any other places. So think of TP, right? Humans use TP, so fecal oral, very simple, very straightforward. Whereas your salmonella, um, other types in terms of species, they're going to use everything else. So they can go via lizards and turtles and vegetables and all sorts of other stuff, and they can pass on to humans. So they have several different types, the gastroenteritic form, the septicemia form, and then they have your enteric typhoidal fevers as well. So remember, the important thing, right, is that salmonella, remember, salmons swim upstream when the when it's the correct time in their lives, right? Um, so it's acid labile. So only when the stomach acid content is um, in terms of pH is increased, can salmonella fully properly invade. So um, remember, shigella is acid stable. So even if you, you can get shigella right off the bat, even if you don't, um, you don't have, if you're not on proton pump inhibitors or H. pylori being infected or anything else. But salmonella, you need to have some kind of gastrointestinal content level changes in terms of pH. Okay, enterocolitis, as outlined, young, right? Elderly, bimodal distribution. So keep that in mind. Often associated with cancer and sickle cell. No need to know the enterocolitis version very well, right? Because of the cancer and the sickle cell kind of presentation. The septicemia one is often associated with AIDS defining, okay? If you remember AIDS for salmonella, for septicemia, septicemia is gonna happen a lot with your AIDS components. So just keep that in mind. Um, and the key kind of virulence factor in the pathogenesis is associated with SP1, which is a salmonella pathogenicity island one. That's for attachment. You get, you get one ticket to enter the island. You get the second ticket to leave the island. That's how I remember it. And the second ticket to leave the island is for you to mess up the entire system before you go. Okay. Once again, type three secret, secretory system. There's a couple of different um, ones that can do this. So remember and review the type three secretory system bacterias. Okay, 
once again, it's superimposed by some kind of gastric acid changes. You can use antibiotics, you could have used um, proton pump inhibitors, you can have H. pylori, um, and a couple of the GI drugs that we've covered previously. Okay. Now, diagnosis and treatment, whenever you see a person with uh, the maculopapular rash and they have um, hemorrhagic um, kind of diarrhea, right? Not hemorrhagic, but like um, bloody diarrhea, um, dysentery in general, it's going to be associated with the S-typhi or the paratyphi. Okay, keep that in mind. Now there's the reptile version that's called salmonosis. Okay, Sal salmonellosis. That's typically associated with like if a veterinarian or someone who's like been working or a children who's just bought a, I don't know, a, a sea turtle, I guess. Um, so, and frogs. Who buys sea turtles and frogs? Okay, anyway, um, but it do be like that sometimes and people buy weird stuff and they get salmonosis that way too. Now, once again, diagnosis in McConkey it's going to be pale. So what's going to be actually make it pink? It's E. coli species. So Salmonella shigella, McConkey, pale. Your Salmonella shigella agar, it's going to be, your Salmonella is going to be positive, right? In terms of H2S positive, your shigella is going to be H2S negative. Very important distinguishing factor in your S and S agar. EMB, your eosin methylene blue um, test is also going to be performed. Salmonella, swim, um, and it's a gram negative rod. So you're going to do your gram staining and then lactose fermenter is negative, very similar to your McConkey agar. Campylobacter species, um, we've covered this slightly, but what you need to know is that the Campylobacter species in terms of morphology is gram negative. And once again, Campylobacter, H. pylori, and um, jujuni are all involved in your oxidase positive species. Okay, they're oxidase positive. They all come together in one big happy family. It's gram negative family of oxidase positive species. Um, it's microaerophilic, so you got to know this bit. So it can actually do a little bit of oxygen, but mostly lives for that carbon dioxide, very neutral lifestyle. Um, associated with poultry, um, cows, sheep, cats, and puppies, and all sorts of stuff. Um, overall, the endotoxin, enterotoxin, and cytotoxin all do different components, right? But the enterotoxin, watery diarrhea, cytotoxin, bloody diarrhea, very simple that way. Now, often associated with the Campylobacter jujuni species is your, um, almost like your perineoplastic syndrome, right? It's going to often present with um, Guillain-Barre. So typically imagine Oh, like every house episode, um, house MD episode often presents with like, oh, they just had a stomach pain. Oh, um, the patient has, you know, um, ascending paralysis that's starting from their lower limbs. And you're like, wait, but the, he keeps on saying Guillain-Barre. I don't know what it means, but it's basically caused by an autoimmune reaction um, and certain antibodies being formed that attacks the um the myelin sheets of your peripheral neurons. So it's going to be ascending in nature and Guillain-Barre is going to be often seen with this. And remember, it can lead to um, demyelinated polyneuropathies, uh, right? So any sort of demyelination of that's associated with Guillain-Barre. It can also have um, issues with CAN-C, CAN-P, can climatry. So reactive arthritis, CAN-P, and you're going to have um, several other things presenting with this. Guess what? We're going to cover bubonic plague. No, I'm not kidding. Like we're... We we're going to cover the other half of this species, which is the Yersinia enterocolitica species. Remember, this is a gram-negative, bipolar, and the buzzword for this is safety pin, right? Because remember, like safety pin was associated with also the bubonic plague, which is the pesticide version of this. Um, now, the way this kind of functions is via a um, ST enterotoxin. So remember, ST go goes to San Gabriel. So cyclic GMP gets elevated and you basically have majority of the important information that you need for this. It's going to invade, it's going to cause pseudo appendicitis because it's going to affect specifically your Peyer's patches and it's going to invade through your M cells. And if you guys remember your M cells are involved in your, in, in basically sucking up any sort of bad stuff that's being brought in and constantly being testing for any sort of um, pathogenic states, and it's going to try to destroy any sort of bacteria, viruses, and et cetera. Now, your vibro cholera species um, versus your non cholera species is very important because what did I tell you guys? Your cholera species is actually going to stain yellow. It's, it has the exact same profile. There's nothing magical about this, but 
Um, your hemolyticus is often associated with raw fish, right? It's a number one foodborne il illness. Raw fish produces enterotoxin and hemolysin, bloody diarrhea, very simple. It has adhesion components. It has extracellular components. But what you need to know, the distinguishing factor from the cholera versus the non-cholera, the non-cholera species, such as the parahemolyticus and vulnificus, both don't do um, sucrose. So in terms of your TCBS, they're going to not do it. Okay, so they're going to be um, sugar negative and they're going to be just green, whereas your cholera is going to be yellow in terms of that culture. And it often is associated with Mexico and raw food, shellfish. Um, and the this one, especially when you get cutaneous lesions of the vibrio vulnificus, that's going to be associated with often underlying malignancy like liver pathology. And that's going to cause like all this um, uh, amputation that you're going to have to do in order to sequester this bacteria from getting into systemic and problematic issues. Remember, it can cause sepsis and sepsis is bad, okay? All right, the hardest of the hardest, hepatitis. Let's do this thing, okay. Hepatitis A, okay? The way I remember hepatitis A is that it's associated with your Picorna viridae family. And that's, that's the same one associated with your rhinovirus. So remember, your rhinovirus is very simple. It's not gonna lead to anything bad overall, but it's still a non-enveloped icosahedral single-stranded positive sense RNA virus. It's part of your Picona Verde family. Now it's acid stable. It's hella stable, right? Like I'm telling you, it's, it can, it can deal with very, very acidic uh, situations. It can, you can throw detergent at it. You can throw anything under the sun at it. Um, and what essentially happens is it's going to stay alive. And the the hepatitis virus is very resilient in that. So the only inactivating thing is um, chlorine, heat, and formalin and UV radiation. Obviously some very, very strong stuff that can destroy this thing. Like overall, in terms of your regular, like I'm gonna wipe down the counter. No, it, you're still gonna likely get hepatitis. But the most often route for this in terms of A and E are going to be done. Think of your vowels and they sound like bowels. And that's gonna be associated with your fecal oral route. So A and E, these are vowels, right? A E I O U. Please hope, hopefully, you guys remember your vowels. Um, those are associated with your vowels. So, bowel, and that's going to be the route of transmission. Now, the important thing, whenever you're thinking of your um, HEP A, know that whenever you have your kind of serological uh, testing for the antibodies for this, the first thing that's going to spike. Um, is going to be um, the virus in the feces. Because remember, that's where it wants to first do its replication and then get released out into the world. The next thing to go up is your HAV, right? Your hepatitis A virus specific antibodies for IgM. That's whenever you see IgM, typically, it's gonna tell you it's an active infection, right? Now, when you're getting over this infection, IgG kicks in. So whenever you see HAV specific IgG, boom, you know that you build a resistance to H uh, hepatitis A, you're solid. Now, treatment in terms of pre prevention, there is a basic administration of uh, vaccination for this. Your hep B and hep A are often vaccinated anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. Kids aren't allowed to get into schools without this stuff, so it's like really important. So booster is given in two dosages, six months, and then 12 months after the initial, six to 12 months after the initial shot. So keep that in mind. Um, here it is in terms of the overall outline. IgM, active infection, IgG, you got a vaccination or you, you gain some natural immunity for it. So keep that in mind in your solid. And whenever you see HAV RNA in the serum or in the stool, it tells you that you're still in the active infection period. Okay. Now your hepatitis E. This one, like I told you guys, vowels, vowels. So A and E is transmitted fecal orally, and you should be solid with that. Now, the E part of it is expecting and fully aware of the risks, like, you know, women who are fully aware of the risk of being pregnant and have hep E can develop fulament um, hepatitis. Now, if you guys remember back to our GI path, fulamentous hepatitis is very quick and severe hepatitis that can lead to liver shutdown, cirrhosis, and death, right? No bueno, not a fun time for anybody involved but it's often associated with, um, once again, fecal oral kind of transmission. Um, remember, what you're gonna be monitoring is their liver function enzymes first, and then you're gonna be doing the exact same thing like you were doing for hep A. You're gonna be monitoring your IgM 
right, in terms of antibodies against HEV, and then your IgG in terms of if it's a result. Okay, nice and simple, nothing too crazy. But the important thing to note is that avoid drinking bad waters in weird places um, when you're traveling. Remember, always cook, eat, and have properly um, foods that are well maintained and prepared. Um, and mostly high mortality in women who are expecting or pregnant. Hep C, okay, C for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, it's associated with Hep C and Hep B in terms of hepatocellular carcinoma. So keep that in mind. B C. Um, think of birth control also affecting your liver. So if you make those multi-order connections, you should be so solid. And the development of this is from a enveloped icosahedral single-stranded positive sense RNA virus. It's part of your flavivirus. Okay. Um, now the way this gets in, it's quite quite simple. Think of your, all of the flabby fun that you could have. So think of getting tattoos, think of having fun with someone else. Um, and all of the other kind of components are all done, um, and could be considered for your hep C, right? Tattoos, parties, all sorts of fun stuff. Okay. Um, and remember it's part of your group seven replication and it has its own RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And the, the reason I'm saying that emphasizing that is because there are certain um, specific antivirals that you can give that target this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that can help shut down the hep C virus before it gets too out of whack. Now remember, hep C, okay, um, this is another nice mnemonic or a little saying. When it comes to viral hepatitis, the vowels and the bowels, they only cause acute hepatitis, right? A and E, right? Acute, right? A capitalized and E capitalized acute hepatitis. While the consonants B, C, and D, I'm, I swear I'm giving you guys an English lesson, is associated with chronic sequelae, right? Like these are chronic conditions. B, C, and D can become chronic um, uh, your your hepatitis, and that's that's not that's not good. In terms of your viral serology, it's going to be very similar, right? In terms of what we looked at for your C, right? Like it's gonna it, it can either be acute, right? Your anti HCV or your HCV RNA would decrease. Your anti HCV um, IgM is going to be elevated when you're coming out of it. Now, if it continues, anti-HCV continues to go strong and your HIV RNA, HCV, not HIV, HCV RNA continues to go up and down, that's telling you that you're moving into the chronic hepatitis point. So keep that in mind. This is one of the simpler ones. When we cover hepatitis B, it tends to get complicated. Okay. Um, sorry, Kendra. Also, another thing you can remember is like both since A and E go together, they're also both non-enveloped and the rest are enveloped. So another way to remember them. There we go. More ways to remember all these hepatitis and how they present to gather in terms of similarities, because they are going to be tested based off of the biological features as well as the um, chronic versus acute and what um, actual serum levels are going to be increased. Thanks, Priya. All right. As with all hepatitis, remember the hepatitis virus itself isn't causing the problem. It's because your MHC class one CD8 cytotoxic T cell lymphocyte destroyers are just coming in, bombarding everything under the sun. And in that process, they take out wonderful hepatocytes in the process. So that's not good. So your hepatitis B virus is an envelope circular partial DSDNA, right? This is really important. The partial DSDNA tells you a very big story. So it brings with it, right? It uses RNA dependent DNA polymerase and a, which is basically a reverse transcriptase to then complete its genetic kind of makeup and lead to this entire presentation um, that we're gonna cover. Now, remember it's unusually stable at low pHs and it can resist like freezing detergents and everything you throw at it. So it's kind of important that you know that very well. And a little buzzwordy thing that SGU likes is when you have a fully functioning hepatitis B, it's called the Dane particle. So Dane particle, think associate with hepatitis B, okay? Once again, um, it's just like your hep C, all of the fun stuff um, uh, in, in sort of like needle stick. You can also have like a vertical transmission in terms of childbirth, open wounds, needle stick injuries, tattoos, piercing, razors, like toothbrushes, apparently toothbrushes. So I guess nothing is safe nowadays. Um, all I can say is that in terms of prevention, a first shot is given for hepatitis B right when you are born. A second shot is given typically one to two months right after. 
And then uh, the third booster is given six to 18 months after. So three shots for hep B, um, very important to keep that in mind. So why is hep B so bad? Well, because it, it can actually lead to a lot of systemic presentation due to the fact that it messes up the liver so much with the whole auto, not autoimmune, but like the MHC mediated cellular destruction. So there's several different components. There is several protein regions that are often asked about. So, but let's kind of quickly go over them. The surface antigen is the first thing that you need to know. That surface antigen is often used to, um, when you're going kind of sequentially to test and identify what's important. And the DNA polymerase isn't often asked about. There's the E antigen. What not too much is actually known about the E antigen, but it is um, important in the early on in terms of the infectivity. So I'm gonna kind of go over the mnemonics for remembering them. Um, and then finally, there is the ORFX, which is the hep BX protein that's as associated with the hepatocarcinogenesis pathway. So keep that in mind. Um, so P for polymerase, S for surface protein, C for the core or capsid protein. E is often associated with the um, carcinoma, hepatocellular carcinoma risk. And X is also associated with the hepatocarcinoma kind of pathway. Now let's kind of go through the infectivity kind of approaches and the, I gave you guys a lot on this slide, but it's for good reason because all of this works together to paint a good picture. Um, it, this I've outlined all of the surface components as well as the internal components. The first thing that will spike in terms of a hep B is the HBS antigen, right? Um, now that antigen is gonna tell you a lot right off the bat. And then hep E is all, or, sorry, HBS, HBEAG antigen is going to spike also with um, the surface antigen. <clears throat> now, when you're going through this, you're also going to be monitoring the DNA and the transaminases to see how bad things are. Now, when you get to um, the window period, the window period is the one that often trips up a lot of people. The thing that's going to be involved with the window period is typically going to be your antigen for your HBC IgM, right? That telling you that things are going, going well in terms of the infection that should be going downwards, right? When you're monitoring. And then your anti-HBC um, IgG is gonna be telling you that you're recovering. And we're gonna go through the individual components one by one, but remember this is that whenever you have HBE antigen, right? It's gonna be highly infectious. E for infectious, okay? That's a little quirky one, but I want you guys to know that. Um, in the window period, what they like to ask for is, is either the absence of HBS antigen or anti-HBS detectable bound versions of it. But what you should test for is the capsid one, right? Anti-HBC for determining um, where they are in terms of infectivity. Now, if it's a chronic thing, that's when you start testing for the core antigen again, right? Um, and the antibodies and see if it's either IgG or IgM. What did I tell you guys about IgM? IgM is an active infection and a inactive um, or like you acquired a kind of protective factor is gonna be associated with um, IgG, okay? Now, your hepatitis delta virus, how I like to remember is the three Ds of hepatitis. It's a D is a defective delta virus dependent on HB, the HBS antigen to stay functioning. So it's a single stranded negative sense RNA rod shaped, right? It basically steals the um, surface antigens from the um, HBS infection, right? So what you need to know is that it can't happen by itself. No one can ever appear with the Delta version of it by itself. They often need either a B or they get um, a dual stick in uh, or a dual kind of exposure. And that can be either a co-infection or a super infection. And I want you guys to keep that in mind. If you guys get a super infection, like it sounds, it's often worse, right? Super infection, super bad, right? Co-infection tends to be not bad because it's, you know, it's, it's happening together. You can typically try to treat for both of it at once. So keep that in mind. But once again, del the Delta version also uses um, the same route, right? Sexual, parenteral, or uh, um, perinatal. Okay. Cool beans. And here is more from first aid that outlines all of it. Um, 
remember what happens in the window period because that's often asked asked about and here's the breakdown of all of it like in terms of what i've talked about um and here i've outlined what happens in both the late or sorry like the early acute version as well as the late version and you guys can test yourself based off of that, um, based off of it's a chronic HPV, low infectivity, what happens. Whenever you think of infectivity, I want you guys to commit to memory HPE antigens, okay? If you guys remember that, then you know that if the patient presents with chronic HPV, right, they have elevated levels of both the surface and they're going to have elevated levels of the E and they're going to be involved in IgG because your body is like constantly fighting them. They're churning out anti- um, anti-surface components, anti-capsid components, and they're going to be quite solid. Here, I gave you guys a nice outline that you guys can run by one by one in terms of susceptibility, immuno, uh, immune due to natural infection, right? That's just, you just have a straight up HBS antigen, um, sorry, yeah, antigen. So keep that in mind, um, being negative, and then you have anti-capsid and anti-surface. Now, the capsid component we don't use, right? In terms of what we give in terms of vaccination, we only give the surface component, okay? The surface component is active immunity due to immunization, right? That's coming from this, okay? Now, chronic infections, this is something important. You're gonna get IgM, anti-HBC is gonna be negative, right? It's not no longer acute. IgM can only stay active for the acute period of time. So keep that in mind and you should be solid. Here's another nice summary in terms of timing of how all of this goes and the progress to chron a chronic state, um, as well as immunization kind of um, presentation as well as the global classification. All right, we're gonna take a mini pause here and we will pick right back up on the food poisoning DLA. Alrighty, guys, um, continuing off where we left off. So we're going to cover just a little bit of clarification that um, I, I had one when I was going through this material. So the important thing to note in terms of the window period that they often like to ask about is that it's associated with um, specifically the anti the E component as well as the anti um, BCIgM. Okay, so that's the um, capsid or core protein, as well as the anti-HBE, which is the, um, if you like think about E as an infective component. So that those are the two components that are involved in the window period. So just make sure you guys review that. Um, as always, hepatitis D, right? It's the delta, right? It's associated with um, the defective delta component. So it's a single-stranded RNA rod-shaped extensive base pairing, right? It's often only available um, to do its cellular function with the involvement of HBS um, antibodies, right? So moving right along. We have, I have, I put together several different components that you guys can use to test yourself on um, in terms of what the susceptibility component is, as well as the immunization and the natural infection, um, as well as um, immune due to immunization is just going to be associated with a positive anti-HBS um, antibodies, right? Um, so whenever you start seeing anything with antigens, um, remember those are the ones that are present on the actual virus itself, then you have a solid understanding of what you're working with. Um, here's a nice summary of all of the different components involved with this. So make sure you guys review that. And now we're going to move right along to our food poisoning DLA. The important thing to note with that is that food poisoning, right, as compared to foodborne uh, pathogens is that they're going to often present with less than eight hours of, um, of presentation, right? In terms of your clinical presentation, whether it's um, vomiting, whether it's due to something else, it's often going to present quicker, right? Because these are preformed toxins um, that are going to be very quick uh, in terms of onset. So less than often even six hours, maybe even as soon as 20 minutes upon digestion, there might be vomiting um, or anything else. So Let's start off the bat with the Staphylococcus RS species. And like I mentioned early on, what you need to remember is that the gram-positive components 
right? As the catalase positive and coagulase positive, as well as aerobic and it's a beta hemolytic. And we've seen Staphylococcus aureus, S aureus, time and time again. And once again, it's often associated with poorly cooked meats, baked foods, right? Often cream filled, um, dairy pro producing um, products, as well as mayonnaise, fruits and vegetables and salads. So what it's really kind of unique with this in terms of its virulence factor is that it's, it actually has an ST enterotoxin, which stimulates both the vagus and the sympathetic um, systems simultaneously. So um, in terms of how it works, in, in, it's often kind of a mixed bag, but it often has hematemesis, um, not hematemesis, emesis within six hours of ingestion. So that's going to be vomiting due to the neurological toxin, diarrhea due, due to the enterotoxin, which is ST. And if you guys remember, it's going to, um, the ST component is going to be associated with your cyclic GMP being increased. And it's often a self-limiting diarrhea that results within 24 to 48 hours. So what do you have to do in terms of supplemental support? Make sure that they're hydrated, make sure that you give them proper electrolytes and they should be good in terms of diagnosis. If you do need to follow up with it in terms of mannitol, salt auger, um, Bart Parker, as well as coagulase test in order to test for it. Now, we did cover the bacillus cirrus um, type before, and I just want to reinforce the point that it can present as a food poisoning type as well. This is a preformed toxin often associated with your Chinese restaurant syndrome. That sounds bad to say, but it's often pre-cooked rice in large quantities, and it's a very stable type of presentation. It's a gram-positive large rod arranged in chains and aerobic slash spore forming capacity. Um, so make sure you guys remember what are the spore forming. So um, your, your clostridium family often does spore forming as well. So the perforinous one. So keep that in mind. Think of your spore formers, what you, you can likely have as differentials, but often the bacillus cirrus is associated with the rice and pulses. So it's often associated with the preformed toxin. It's a ST neurotoxin as well as an emetic peptide toxin. Once again, emesis very quickly, as early as six hours, blood agar and polymyxes in terms of spore containing food, and you should be solid. Now, your botulinum, clostridium botulinum, we've actually seen before. It's um, your botulism, right? When we covered botulism previously, we covered it in terms of um, in, in terms of tetanus, right? And remember here, there it's a neurotoxin and often found in canned foods, such as applesauce, fruits, vegetables, you can even find in pasta sauce. Um, and it loves to be absorbed by the intestines circulating through the blood um, and it can affect cranial as well as peripheral nerves. So central nervous system as well as peripheral nervous system. Um, Clostridium botulinum is actually the reason why we don't give babies um, honey right off the bat, because they can often um, present with floppy baby syndrome. And I, I know it says flop baby syndrome. That sounds like a, like a baby that isn't like performing up to speed, but it's a floppy baby syndrome. And it's associated with um, the fact that these babies have no protective um, GIT flora leading to the spores that are just forming these toxins um, and leading to the classic presentation. Remember um, the there are similar presenting factors with Clostridium botulinum since it affects the central nervous system as well as the peripheral is that they can often look like Yambare or Myasthenia gravis. Um, so keep that in mind as your differentials. So remember, these are often gonna present slower and they're gonna often be preceded by some kind of virulent uh, vir virus that has affected the GIT. Okay, in terms of your fungi, um, what you do need to know is your mushrooms. So the fungal toxins, they're short acting, often seen in your mucinol, muscarine, and psilocybins. And remember, psilocybins are your, your, your fun, crazy mushrooms. So they're basically your PCP. Um, keep that in mind. Um, often incubation is very quick. It's often followed by vomiting, diarrhea, long acting kind of mushrooms that we can keep in mind as differentials is Amanita, right? That's your death cap mushroom. Um, they mess with the polymerization of your actin um, kind of components. So your actually your microfilament, not your actin. Um, and they have an incubation that's very short, right? So, you know, classical stem is often a hiker goes in, grabs some mushrooms from the forest, cooks it and boom diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, that's due to um, those filaments being messed up. 
Your, your mycotoxy fungi, mycotoxigenic fungi, are often associated with your tree nut, peanuts, as well as oil kind of seeds. They often cause acute necrosis, cirrhosis, and liver carcinomas, but most often time they're not tested. Your ciguatera toxin, right? These are part of your dinoflagellates, right? They're often found in terms of your fishes, your barracudas, groupers, uh, reef fishes. They produce an ST toxin, right? Um, once again, stable toxin, once again. So very quick onset after ingestion, they're pre-made toxins, watery diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, extrem extremity paresthesias, severe pyritis. Think about that in terms of itching, right? Sega toxins. So Sega toxins often have these very quick um, and they're, they're dinoflagellate. So um, what you need to often remember with that is that you can settle on a temperature so they can either run hot or cold. So they, but they run back and forth in terms of classic presentation. Um, your your non-allergic histamine or your scombroid fact kind of group ones are associated with your tuna, mahi-mahi, and marlin. And these are very quick because histamine acts all very quickly on your respiratory as well as your um, GIT, because histamine is one of the primary predominating factors of those systems. So what you're going to have is the burning metallic taste in the mouth. That's due to the histamine actually interacting with the receptors of your taste bud, watery diarrhea, nausea, urticaria, and facial flushing. Now, the neurological shellfish, um, brevitoxins, these are the ones we've actually seen back when we were covering um, term three. So your dinoflagellates, right? Those are associated with often the Gulf of Mexico. Now, when we when we covered a couple of other bacterial species, they were also associated with your um, with your Gulf of Mexico. Now, the virulence factor, the brevitoxin, is very quick in terms of its onset. It's going to present with paresthesias, numbness, tingling the extremities. GI symptoms are often present. This is a neurological shellfish, brevitoxin versus your saxitoxin. I like to think of your saxophone. Um, once again, this is also part of your dinoflagellates. So what you need to remember is that the virulence factor for this is, um, is gonna be very similar to you playing a saxophone. You're gonna be playing the saxophone with your mouth. So that's gonna be tingling in your mouth. You're gonna ataxia, which is gonna be um, in a very strict, rigid position that you're gonna be playing. Um, same thing with the muscular paralysis, since you're holding the saxophone in a unique way. And then you're going to have respiratory paralysis because you're breathing a lot in order to play the saxophone. And then the GI symptoms, um, because it's going to be less common because you're playing the saxophone and you're not going to be um, having diarrhea while you're playing saxophone, hopefully. Now, the parasites, that's what we're going to cover next. Um, and as always, I have my fun little um, sayings to hopefully keep you guys entertained and going. So your fascicula hepatica and your fascicola gigantica, um, there are liver flukes as well as your giant flukes. And the important thing to note with this is that they are typically um, trematodes. These are trematodes, okay? So these are flat. Um, they have kind of a one opening, right, in their whole kind of system, a d digestive system. And their freshwater intermediate host is the snail, okay? Freshwater snails, they love asking about this and their definitive host is sheep, goat, cattle, and other herbivores. And that's where they like to kind of hang out and until the humans kind of get in contact with the contaminated water. And remember, once again, fecal oral route. So keep that in mind. Now, the clinical manifestations are very generalized. There's an acute period and there's a chronic period. And remember, that's the migratory larva period. That's very quick. The chronic phase is very, um, very generic in the nature that it can affect a lot of different things, blockade of the biliary tract, inflammation of the gallbladder, biliary lithiasis, so many different things can present with this. But the important thing to note is that often they're treated with um, antiparasitic um, compounds and you should be good. Um, these are your uh, optic choriasis sinesis, which are your liver flukes. Um, now, the important thing to note is that they're once again trematodes. So there's only um, kind of a one oral kind of cavity and everything else kind of follows through with that. Um, now, what they often cause um, and what they're associated with in terms of foodborne illnesses is raw pickled or smoked fish. So keep that in mind. Once again, they have freshwater snails as their intermediary host. But remember, there's with this, there's no... Um, the, no sheeps or anything of that nature involved. So if you have that in mind, you should be good. Um, remember, 
it's mild and often asymptomatic. They're going to have biliary obstruction. A lot of different things cause biliary obstruction and a chronic infection can actually cause adenocarcinoma of the biliary ducts. Now, enter amoeba histolytica. Important to note is a pseudopod forming protozoa. Um, it's often round looking. They often have like these peeping eye um, kind of presentation. So think of those eyes kind of creepily staring at you. Um, location is often Central America, uh, Africa and Indian continent. And um, often it's associated with um, M2M, but it could literally affect anyone because there's a fecal oral route of transmission. Um, and they have these hallmark flask-like ulcerations that often present. And that's what is outlined here. So think of this as like a flask. So um, although it kind of looks kind of weird at that moment. Um, and the important thing to note is that it's associated with intestinal amoebiasis. So it can either be watery diarrhea or bloody diarrhea. And there's liver abscesses associated with this. There's PCR serology antigen testing that you can do with this. Buzzword for this is going to be um, anchovies kind of like sauce in terms of imaging. But um, another thing to, and an important thing that wasn't mentioned here is that there's actually um, about three or four RBCs that can often be present in the enteramoeba histolytica. They like to hold on to these RBCs um, and they're, they can be um, dual nucleated. So keep that in mind as well. Your palantidium coli, um, it's often associated. Um, I, I like to think of coli as in your um, palantidium, it's in like the pig from from Singh, which is, uh, and it's, you know, location-wise is Latin America, Southeastern Asia, Papua New Guinea pig. So guinea pig, think of it as um, your host as being pig. Pathogenesis, often ingestion of the cyst. Um, they affect the small intestines, trophozoites in the cell wall. The cysts are released into the stool. Um, once again, the important thing to note with this is the pig and the trophozoites and the cysts in the stool, and you should be solid with that. Often asymptomatic, it could have intermediate di diarrhea, but the important thing is you're going to find necrosis, ulceration, ciliated trophozyte, trophozytes, um, trophozytes, and scraped um, kind of appearance that you can also uh, take away. Now the famous one, Giardia intestinalis, the famous famous one that has a very spooky looking um, appearance. It's a flagellated protozoa. It's binucleated pear shaped. Now, the important thing is when it goes from its cyst form to the trophozyte form, the cyst form as actually has four uh, of these eyes. When you have the um, actual trophozyte form or the active form, that's when it has only two eyes and four flagellas, right? There are no flagellas in the cyst. In the cystic form, it is straight up just four nuclei. So keep that in mind. It's a waterborne illness often found in like um, in contaminated uh, locations that have like access. It's a fecal oral route essentially, but they can be found in basically anywhere in the world, uh, Asia, other parts. Um, what you do need to know, it's a very abrupt onset um, after one to two weeks. So you're going to have steatorrhea, right? This is a very important thing. You, you, when you ever think of steatorrhea, you have poor malabsorption of your fats and cholesterol. So think of it that way, abdominal pain, flatulence, et cetera. Um, the cystic form um, and the incubation and the active form is done via the trophozytes. So cystic, um, it's inactive. That's the one that's found in the water and the trophozytes are what the active form are. So they can be found in inactive stool. Um, that's when they're like, they're more protected. And in the diagnosis stage, they're often found in cysts or trophozytes, depending on what you do in terms of stool collection, or you're doing a endoscopy slash biopsy. Like your cyclospora chi chitinesis. Um, so that sounds like cayenne peppers. Um, that's how you can kind of remember this. They're often found in parts of the United States. So Wisconsin, Georgia, New York, Texas, and also, honestly, most tropical regions. They're often associated with cilantro. Think of Mexican food. So cilantro, cayenne, cayenne tea ceases, and peppers. So remember with these um, that they're, they're often done because they're spore, sporozytes that we're considering. The size of these actual sporozytes matter. So if when you're looking at these and they're very small in terms of size and they're eight to 10, okay, that's telling you that these are your cyclosporous, okay? So they're going to be oocytes in the stool, zeal nelson in terms of staining and spor, uh, sporulated oocytes, okay? Remember, 
sporulated oocytes, very important here to know for sure. Now your cryptospora, right? Cryptosporas tend to be 20 to 30 um, in terms of size wise. Um, now, the way you can remember it is big old belly, okay? Big old belly, South American, African, Southeast Asian are often the location that we often think about when we are working with this species. Daycare centers, immunosuppressed, psychiatric institutions are often at risk too. But remember, whenever you're seeing these big protruding nuclei, belly-like components, then boom, you know you're working with the cystospora, cysto Cystosoa spora belly, right? So it's a big belly ones. Um, and the kind of the unique factor with this is has autofluorescence. So they kind of light up by themselves. They're kind of like glow sticks. Um, so keep that in mind in terms of sizing and um, how they present in terms of imaging. This one's a very good one, intramoeba um, vermicularis. So this is a entrobias vermicularis, my apologies. Pinworm, it is about um, very, very, very common kind of presentation. It's a, it's seen often in young children. Once again, fecal oral route in terms of transmission. They love to um, have this kind of as a common question because it's a very buzzword heavy one. Um, it often presents with perianal itching um, slash pruritus slash scratching. So itchy butt syndrome is often associated with this. And the buzzword slash thing is the positive scotch tape test shows eggs, right? So keep that in mind um, and you should be solid. Okay, the trichores curi, um, all of the T's are kind of involved in this. Um, so if you, it's actually built into the name. Uh, it's a tricky tricks, okay? So there's all the T for trichores trichuri um, and trichuri, I cannot say these names. Um, often presents with kind of uh, growth slash mental developmental challenges, iron deficiency anemia, right? Um, across the world, it's kind of seen, it's about four centimeters long. Clubbing of the fingers is, is also presented with this. Inflammatory dysentery, um, as well as uh, seen with someone who has soil injection. So some maybe like outdoor cooking exposure to um, meat that has been hanging out in general soil. Now, when you're doing the diagnostics test, you're going to see the eggs in the stool, but they're going to be barrel shaped in nature. And you're like, wait, where's the barrel? This doesn't look like a barrel. So they have two openings. So if you can kind of imagine, this kind of looks like a barrel. Okay. Now, this one in terms of Diphylobacterium latinum. So I like to think the bathroom sounds like bathroom. So the important thing, this is a cestoid, right? It is a tapeworm. And when you're thinking of your tapeworm, you should think of um, these segmented components that are often going to appear in um, your stool. Okay. And I want to emphasize this. The bathroom component is going to be the buzzword heavy, undercooked fresh water fish. So think of sushi, carp, perch, salmon, so on and so forth. So often they're going to be um, seen in this region. So in the intestines, small intestines. And they're going to have larvae develop into tapeworms in the small intestines. And the proglottids are released in, in egg form and the eggs mature in the water. So your feces is a kind of a water-based component. And the important factor with this is that it's going to present with megaloblastic anemia. So it absorbs B12 through the body. Okay, so keep that in mind. Your hymen... Hymen lepsis nana, which is the dwarf tapeworm. It's associated with Edward tapeworm, most prevalent tapeworm, especially in Asia, Southeastern Europe, Central South America, as well as Africa. Once again, human to human transmission, straight up ingestion of um, embryonated eggs. They hatch, they form oncospheres, they penetrate the mucosa, um, and they eventually develop into these tapeworms and cause the um, actual presentation. Ascaris lumbricoides, important to note, it's a common nematode, tropical developmental slash developing countries. The thing with Ascorides and a couple of other um, nematodes and other kind of parasites we're going to talk about in general is that they are infective in their fertilized eggs, but they have a very unique way that they um, go to the in, from the intestinal system to the respiratory system and then eventually back into their maturing in the GIT. So you're going to ingest these eggs. 
They're going to hatch in the small intestines, but they're going to burrow their way through into the walls and eventually drop themselves into the circulation, which then will go into the lungs. And from the lungs, they're going to have the classic Loeffler syndrome. Okay. Whenever you think of Loeffler syndrome, think of GIT issues as well as um, tracheal slash um, pneumonial issues, right? You're going to have eosinophilic pneumonitis, right? It's going to present with cough. Um, it's going to present with your systemic presentations, um, and they're going to develop into mature worms in the small intestines, eventually producing eggs once again and passes into the stool. And you're going to have pulmonary symptoms as well as bowel obstruction. Your duodenally and Americanus are both hookworms, right? Um, they're still part of your, your whole nematode component. And the important thing to note was that they are going to um, often invade through bare feet exposure in Southern states, as well as tropical climates. So their filariform larva pen penetrates the skin. They're gonna do the very similar thing. They're gonna work their way up, go into the hepatotracheal migration pattern, Loeffler syndrome. So they're gonna present with eosinophilic pneumonitis. They're gonna reach the small intestines. They're gonna mature again. They're gonna shed themselves in the stool and that's a diagnostic feature. And here, they're gonna present with iron deficiency anemia. So important thing to note, now we've covered two different species, hookworm, iron deficiency anemia. Um, so keep that in mind versus those who produce megaloblastic anemia with your B12 deficiency, okay? Your strongyloides, starcholoiasis, um, starcholiasis, I cannot say these. Um, they're as strong as a thread um, or a thread worm. So keep that in mind. These are thread worms. So what you need to know is that they're once again filariform that penetrates the human skin, right? Um, and when you're working with those, these are they're going to cause you to carry a rash at the site of entry. So they're going to cause a rash upon the entry location. And what you need to know is that they actually penetrate through, they turn into adults, and they also cause Loeffler syndrome. So there are several different components that causes Loeffler syndrome. So adult intestines are often involved, right? Eggs are get, getting deposited, and eventually they're going to cause rhabdiformed larvae, diagnostic, right, so on and so forth, eosinophilia, pulmonary symptoms due to Loeffler syndrome, and you're going to have diarrhea. Now, we're going to cover endocrine pathology last, um, and hopefully we can call it a quick one. So important thing to note is that our pituitary is the master gland, but what really controls the master is the hypothalamus. And the important thing to remember is that the pituitary has two different embryological origin. There is the oral ectoderm component, and then there is the neural component um, that comes from the diencephalonic portion of the actual brain. So in terms of pituitary infarcts, right, whenever you're thinking of a pituitary infarct, you've got to remember that due to the dual origin, one can be coagulative necrosis and the other can be liquefactor necrosis. So let's kind of quickly discuss this because it's, it's going to come back up again um, when we cover Sheehan syndrome. But the anterior pituitary, right, is the oral ectoderm, posterior pituitary, straight up um, neural ectoderm, okay? So keep that in mind, coagulative necrosis here and liquid factor necrosis here, right, due to the different embryological origin. Um, now, let's kind of cover your hormones of the anterior pituitary. Remember, growth hormone, prolactin, adenocorticotrophic, hormone, ACTH, thyroid stimulating, follicular stimulating, and luteinizing hormones are all coming from the anterior. And in terms of their coloring, right, in terms of how they're staining, basophilic, B-flat, right? Um, think of your FSH, LH, ACTH, and TSH, whereas your acidophiles, acid pigs, right, are associated with prolactin and GH. So keep that in mind, and you should be solid. The next thing you need to know is your posterior pituitary Know that with your vasopressin antidiuretic hormone, right? And your oxytocin. Now, remember, these are only released, sad pox, right? So keep that in mind. Sad pox is associated with the what? The superoptic nuclei is associated with your antidiuretic hormone, ADH for short. Your oxytocin is from your paraventricular. So keep that solid and you should be good. Now, where does the pituitary sit? It sits in the cella tercica, right? Of your sphenoid bone. Now, whenever you're doing any sort of surgery, right, you're going to go through the transphenoidal spot process via your nasal cavity, and you are going to break through the sphenoid in order to access the cella turcica and do any sort of pituitary level changes. 
remember, any sort of endocrine pathology is going to be critically involved with your positive and negative feedback system. Here in the endocrine, so much is emphasis is given on the negative feedback. So keep that in mind. Your targeted glandular hormones are going to provide negative feedback um, in terms of this. Let's quickly cover your pituitary adenoma as well as hyperpituitarism. Important thing to note is they often arise mid-age all the way to older adults. Remember, they can either be benign um, in nature, but they can often present with mechanical issues. So one, when you do immunohistochemistry staining with the whole, what we covered here, B flat versus um, your acid pig, you'll have a better understanding of what we're talking about, which actual um, adenoma is affected, whether it's a prolactinoma, which is the most common. Very often, um, the one that leads to most problem is the prolactinoma, and that's a functional um, excess hormone producing uh, type of adenoma, versus a non-function. It can also continue to have proliferation, can have actually drastic effects, because remember, um, right up here, right, is the optic uh, chiasm, and if there's any sort of excess you know, development, it can compress on the optic chiasm and it's going to present with bitemporal hemianopsia. Okay. Here are your kind of breakdown, lactotrophs, prolactin, right? And your somatotrophs, growth hormone, corticotrophs, ACTH, pyrotrophs, TSH, and your gonadotrophs, FSH, LH. So associated symptoms, hypogonadism, mass effect, hypopituitarism, hyperthyroidism, Cushing syndrome, in growth hormone, in children, gigantism, right? Um, and then adult acromegaly, so many different things. And your prolactinoma is going to present with galactorrhea, amenorrhea, typically often seen in females, um, sexual dis dysfunction, and infertility. Okay, growth hormone excess. Um, remember, whenever you're thinking of growth hormone excess, think about your children, gigantism, right? They're going to exponentially be bigger than everyone else, right? Like every part of their body is going to be exponentially bigger. Whereas in adults, it's going to often present in localized areas. Acromegaly is often seen in specific tissues. So think of your soft slash skin tissues, um, thyroid, heart, liver, adrenals are all affected. And the bones of your face, hands, and feet are affected. They're going to get bigger, denser, and scarier looking. Bone density may often increase. So it's hyperosteosis because growth hormone is... Um, it leads to increased deposition of calcium. So their bones are going to like be so bright due to the hyper um, ossification of them. And then you're going to have um, proganathism, which is protrusion of the actual jaw. And the way you identify this, even if you can't tell right off the bat, is actually seeing the spacing of their teeth and you'll have a better understanding of it. Now, the next thing is often feet enlargement, mental um, kind of changes as well, because growth hormone has effects on the amount of testosterone and other things produced. Um, that can be also affected menstrual disturbances in women, um, as well as libido impotence in men, diabetes mellitus. You guys have seen this because it um, growth hormone antagonizes. And when you're growing and developing, you actually want insulin antagonized so that you have excess products for breakup of things. So keep that in mind. All right, so continuing on with our diagnosis. So keep this in mind in terms of what we are gonna be looking at. Growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor one are all um, gonna be interconnected. Growth hormone is quickly um, degraded. So it's gonna produce um, less of a kind of a monitoring effect and it's more pulsatile in nature where it says insulin-like growth factor is more stable so you can actually monitor it. The half-life is longer. So the way we test for it is the oral glucose tolerance test, and that's a very important diagnostic factor. Um, so keep that in mind, and it will help you with the whole growth hormone presentation. Hypopituitarism, this is a bit of an important one. Important to note is because when you have hypopituitarism, it gonna, it's going to downregulate a lot of things. It's when you have about a 70% or greater um, loss of parenchyma. Parenchyma is basically like the functioning unit of whatever cell you're, or organ system that you're talking about. Um, often it's going to pre present with diabetes insipidus because remember central diabetes insipidus is associated with this process. So tumors, vascular kind of components, Sheehan syndrome, like we mentioned, um, it's a pituitary infarct and a hypothalamic disorder can often present with this latrogenic um, due to a surgery or radiation, inflammatory lesion, as well as trauma 
of some kind. You can basically uh, snap the stem of the pituitary um, and leading to basically hypopituitarism. Sheehan syndrome. Like I said, what type of necrosis? Coagulative necrosis if it's the anterior pituitary. And you can have liquid factor necrosis if it's the posterior pituitary, because remember, dual embryological origin. Okay, so keep that in mind. Posterior pituitary, it receives blood from the arterial branches, um, much less susceptible to ischemic injury, so therefore usually not affected. Most of the time, it's anterior pituitary. And when you're pregnant, it actually gets twice the size. So keep that in mind with she hands. It's a postpartum um, pituitary infarct, right? So keep that in mind. Basal level of pituitary um, monitoring. You can be influenced by several different things, sleep cycle in terms of um, diet, um, time of day, menstrual cycle, all of these things contribute to it. There's a simulation and suppression test. And there, there's a radiological kind of thing that you can do in terms of seeing if there's any sort of issue. So um, what you can often monitor for, for the anterior pituitary deficiencies are any of the hormones associated with them. Um, you can basically monitor most often growth hormone. If it's not observed in adults, then other things are often involved. Um, so keep that in mind. Cretinism is a, often a, a, another thing due to thyroid stimulation being decreased. So keep that in mind. Posterior pituitary, often seen there too. So posterior pituitary, two really important hormones, right? ADH and oxytocin. And we're going to run through differentials that way. Diabetes insipidus. Okay. Now diabetes insipidus, is caused by excess urination, polyuria, because there's not enough ADH. ADH goes and acts directly on the collecting ducts and parts of the kidney, um, of the nephron specifically, to upregulate aquaporin type two, right? And these aquaporins help bring in water um, and helps concentrate the urine, especially in the collecting duct. Now, there are two types of um, etiology or classifications of them, central versus nephrogenic. So if you guys remember central, dealing with the central nervous system, you're going to be solid. Nephrogenic, it's a problem at the kidney level. So keep it simple, keep it sweet, and you should be good. Often it's going to present with hypokalemia because um, your, your potassium is often lost, and that's going to lead to um, arrhythmias. And you're going to present with hypercalcemia, and that has its own set of presentations in terms of hyperreflexia and several different things. And what often causes it is um, lithium, right? Lithium is a drug that we often prescribe for bipolar disorders in order to bring them back um, to a kind of a euthymic state and they it's kind of a leveled off point. Okay, so keep that in mind. Serum osmolarity versus um, urine osmolarity is often tested to make sure that the clinical features are um, confirmatory. Okay. So how would we evaluate for DI? So whenever we have DI, um, what we essentially do is we check if the urine osmolarity is less than 300 milliosmoles and the serum osmolarity is greater than 290 milliosmoles, okay? Then we shoot them up with desmopressin, which is an analog of ADH, right? Um, and if the, if the urine concentration um, osmolarity increases, right? That means it's central diabetes insipidus because the pituitary isn't making enough ADH. If it's nephrogenic, even after administration of ADH, then um, the, and there's no response to it, then you know for sure that it's nephrogenic and that it's just something happening at the collecting duct levels. And essentially, you have a positive confirmatory test. Okay, now. We talked about hypo kind of ADH secretion. Now, hyper ADH secretion is what we often associate with um, with with SIDH, right? It can be um, it can be often caused by um, secretion of ectopic ADH, right, in the posterior pituitary, or it can be um, associated with a small cell carcinoma of increased ADH secretion. So keep that in mind. Um, or also known as oat cell carcinoma. So it's a non-neoplastic um, disease of the lung and local injury to the hypothalamus or neurohypothesis is often possible as well. So remember, hyponatremia, right, is often going to be involved with this. So why? Because um, you're going to get uh, basically cerebral edema, too much fluid being captured. Um, you're going to get euvolemia due to hypernatremia. 
or sorry, hyponatremia, total water body is increased and that leads to the shutdown of the whole renin angiotensin pathway system. And it's gonna to try to compensate for it and it's, it's can be quite uh, a juggling act. So here's the hyperthyroidism component that we're gonna cover quickly. Remember hyperthyroidism, the most common presentation that we often associate with Graves is diffuse goiter, right? Diffuse is a very important component, the hypothalamic and the pretubular myxedema. Now, the hypothalamic, um, sorry, hypothalamoplegia, right, um, or ophthalmopathy, right, is often associated with increased deposition of glucosaminoglycans, GAGs, in the back of the eye, and that's going to lead to the per, like the protrusion of the eyeball out, and um, it's it can be quite scary to look at, but it's essentially due to the fact that. Um, TGF beta gets activated and that is going to lead to the increased activity of fibroblasts. And those fibroblasts are going to be like, let's put more glucose aminoglycans and see what happens. Hyperthyroidism can be really severe if it is seen with um, a thyroid storm. Okay. A thyroid storm is essentially a very acute high burst of thyroid um, hormone that's being released, especially your T4. So keep that in mind. It can be autoimmune in nature. It can be functional. It can be toxic um, goiters. It can be electrogenic due to radiation or other things. So keep, keep those um, differentials in mind as to how this came about. Now, hyperthyroidism, several different causes. There's the Graves disease. It's the most common one. It's associated with HLA association. Um, toxic hyperfunctional adenomas, it can be less often, multinodular goiter. Um, so remember, all of the G protein kind of pathways of TSH is done through GS, right? It takes um, GTP and converts it into GDP, and that creates cyclic AMP, and then the whole pathway of T3, T4 production is essentially monitored. Thyroiditis can also be associated with this, and that can be seen with subacute the quarven thyroiditis that's often associated with a viral condition. It's all combined with pain, tenderness, and fever. There's also postpartum thyroiditis. Remember, um, due to natural immunosuppression during pregnancy, you can have like a hyperactivation following that. You can have Hashi, Hashito toxicosis. It's a transient toxic, um, thyrotoxicosis caused by a disruption and is followed by uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis. So like it's going to, it's going to be hyper and then hypo followed um, shortly. So keep that in mind. Um, and you should be good in terms of how it presents. Remember, you can have overstimulation due to the thyroid hormone of superior tarsal muscles, the Muller's muscles, um, as well as the classic hallmark presentation of the wide eye appearance. Um, thyroid uh, exothalmos, right? That's associated with the whole, um, with the increased deposition of glucose aminoglycans. All righty. The next component that we're going to quickly run through is the investigation done in the thyroid disorder. Um, TSH measure, right? It's done through typically, right? Your T, FT4 and FT3, right? Your um, thyroid functional en enzymes and tests. So we often monitor both the TSH as well as T4 because those are the functioning type and that tells you where, where you are in terms of thyroid levels. Um, you can have antimicrosomal components, right? Such as the antithyroid peroxidase, your antithyroid globulin antibodies, as well as high titers in Hashimoto thyroiditis, right? So remember, everything's breaking down in Hashimoto thyroiditis because of antibodies against um, the actual uh, converting enzymes such as thyroid peroxidase, okay? Now, the primary hypothyroidism, how it's going to present in terms of lab value is um, primary hypothyroidism, increased DSH because there's no counter regulatory or negative feedback seen with this. So T3 is going to be decreased as well as T4. Primary hyperthyroidism, decreased DSH and just unregulated T3 and um, T4. Here it is in terms of breakdown. Remember with the subacute lymphocytic as well as Hashimoto, they're often non-tender. They affect females most often, can be autoimmune in nature. So keep that in mind. And overall, what we need to remember is that the quervin um, is associated with viral infection and it's uh, seasonal variation. It's going to be um, goiter that's often diffused and enlarged and granulatomous in nature as, uh, as compared to um, your 
your, your Hashimoto and subacute lymphocytic, right? Because they often present with no hurtle cell changes um, and Hashimoto presents with hurtle cell changes with interstitial fibrosis due to the fact that you have autoimmune kind of components. Hashimoto thyroiditis, important to note here, is that it is hypothyroidism, um, most common cause of hypothyroidism in the US. Remember, there's a HLA association with this. Um, and the important thing to note, like I often say, is antimicrosomial as well as antithyroglobulin antibodies, okay? Typically following an infection. And there's an initial phase where you have hyperthyroidism, that's um, Hashi, Hashito toxicosis, and that's very quick onset. Here it is in terms of first aid and a quick summary. Um, Dequerbin, right, is associated with pain. So keep that in mind and you should be good. And I gave you guys a couple of other processes and then there's a congenital hypothyroidism. And this is this can be quite bad because um, this is what they, they used to call as cretinism. Um, and we no longer use that because it's a it's it's not a it's not a correct word to describe this condition. But it, it, it presents with six P's, pot belly pale, puffy face, protruding umbilica, umbilic, umbilicus, protuberant tongue, and poor brain development because thyroid is very much involved in the central nervous system development. And like I mentioned, HLA is involved here. So HLA DR3 is important. So a couple of carcinomas, uh, adenomas that we're gonna cover is the follicular one. Remember with the follicular one, um, it's, it's, often presented uh, generally well-circumcised nodules. Um, the photomicroscopic is well-differentiated follicles resembling normal thyroid, but it's just a lot of it, right? F increased number of follicles uh, where you should just have regular amounts. Your papillary carcinomas often tends to be the biggest presenting type, and they're gonna have um, the presence of papillae and dystrophic calcification. And remember, dystrophic calcification isn't necessarily bad, right? Um, but they are laminated with uh, somomas bodies as well as these orphan anti um, cells and nuclei. And if you guys remember back to your small groups, you're gonna know that they're gonna be associated with mutations such as the BRAF mutation, as well as the RET oncogene mutation. And those are also implicated in your men's uh, men's pathway, right? Like your um, multi um, endocrine pathology pathway, right? So keep that in mind and you should be solid. Medullary carcinomas are often associated with um, your parafollicular. So guess what? Remember what the parafollicular cells produce, it's calcitonin. So calcitonin does what? It's going to um, do help in the bone remodeling component early on and can be deposited as amyloid as ACAL. So keep that in mind, ACAL, think of calcitonin. Um, it's a serum marker. Calcitonin doesn't do much um, later on, but in the early stages of development, it's really important. Okay. Um, neoplasias associated with that is um, the multiple endocrine neoplasias, which is your men's 2A and 2B. And remember, those are associated with your RETS mutation as well. Okay. Okay. In terms of your adrenals, keep this in mind. Um, this is important. Um, sweeter as you go deeper and the GFR. Okay. Sweeter as you go deeper is talking about aldosterone, cortisol, androgens, and estrogens, right? So sweeter as you go deeper, salt, sugar, and sex steroids, okay? Those are the important ones, and you should be solid if you know that. So what do the, all of these do? Cortisol is, is associated with long-term stress. So if you remember long-term stress and the presentations of it, um, you will be solid. A couple of key things to note is that it's going to promote lipolysis, so weight loss. So if you ever think about you being stressed out and losing a whole bunch of weight, but gaining it centrally, that's associated with cortisol. Now, hyperglycemic state because it antagonizes insulin function in tissues because you just want a lot of energy. And there's anti-inflammatory properties with this because remember, cortisol is actually one of the ways we treat a lot of different autoimmune conditions because what it what does it do it messes with phospholipase a2 it also messes with nfk um, component which is involved in the synthesis of a lot of your inflammatory mediators as well as it's going to down regulate cox2 right um, which is associated with your inflammatory state those are all cumulative inflammation information not inflammation um, and glucagon and catecholamines are also going to be increased in capacity because why 
we want our body to be in a stressed out fight versus flight state. Okay. Um, and remember with your aldosterone, that's associated with salt, right? So remember that's your mineral corticoids. Guess what? It's going to deal with sodium and water absorption and the exchange for potassium and hydrogen ions. And that can be quite bad um, if you have increased secretion of it. And androgens, right? Those are important in terms of, um, in, they play a very small role, but it's a vital role early on in development in terms of inducing certain biological features between boys and girls. Um, and remember, we're going to cover the pathological states in both of them. So Cushing's disease versus Cushing's syndrome. Syndrome is talking about a symptom or a series of symptoms. So S is for symptoms, and it's not talking about an actual central thing. So keep that in mind. Um, Cushing's disease is typically due to a tumor of the anterior pituitary, right? So keep testing yourself through the Cushing's syndrome versus Cushing's disease. And the most common cause of Cushing's in general is caused by iatrogenic usage, right? Typically, you're taking excess um, uh, exogenous uh, cortisol, and that cortisol is going to lead to um, uh, atrophy of the adrenals, especially the adrenal um adrenals in terms of decreased pituitary release of ACTH and several other things, okay? All right, how do we test for this? We're gonna often use um, in terms of increase is very simple. You just give um, a high dose dexamethasone. If the pituitary is functioning and its uh, cortisol levels are suppressed, it's due to a pituitary adenoma because you've given them a little bit more. So the pituitary starts freaking out saying, this is a lot of negative feedback. We need to shut down. So that's telling you it's a pituitary adenoma. So keep this in mind because that's a highly tested thing. And the cortisol level, if it's not suppressed, that's due to either you having to do a chest x-ray to rule out any sort of Cushing syndrome from a liver um, sorry, not liver, but from a lung pathology, as well as um, ectopic causes coming directly from the uh, adrenal gland itself. Okay. Now, if ACTH is decreased in general, there's no suppression of cortisol. There's like with a low or high dose dexamethasone, you have um, adrenals or biopsy to rule out an adrenal kind of tumor, right? Now, hyperaldosteronism, right? Aldosterone, we're talking about mineral corticoids, which are coming from your glomerulosa, okay? Um, glomerulosa, reticularis, um, and your fasciculata. So remember going through all of them, you guys should be solid on where, what each of them produce, okay? Hyperaldosteronism, remember, is associated with Kahn syndrome. It can often be idiopathic or adenocarcinoma or um, in nature, and most of the time, it's going to lead to salt retention. And this is going to be either independent or dependent on the renin-angiotensin pathway. So if it's primary, it's happening at the adrenal level, it's going to be primary. So it's happening at the organ of concern. Whereas secondary is going to be caused by increased renin-angiotensin uh, renin pathway. That's typically due to maybe liver cirrhosis, leading to hypovolemia, um, leading to uh, maybe heart failure or nephrotic syndrome that could are all precipitating factors for this. So that's what I wanted to outline here. Um, what is it going to do? It's going to cause hypertension and it's going to cause the increased retention of bicarb and loss of potassium. Okay. That's really important to know. Loss of potassium is critical in this case. And if you remember that and you should be solid. Okay. So increase in aldosterone renin um, ratio, ARR is the screening test that we're going to use. Confirmatory, you're going to do a sodium load test and see how they react. You can also do a suppression test to see um, what happens in terms of urine volume, as well as edema. CT scan often used to subclassify if it's unilateral, bilateral, or macroadenomas, bilateral hyperplasias, et cetera. Now, waterhouse friedrichsen syndrome, you're probably wondering, what does this mean? It just basically means that you have a hemorrhagic necrosis, and it often happens in children. Now, the etiology is often due to Neisseria meningitidis. So Neisseria meningitidis, like it sounds, it causes meningitis in children and septicemia. Other kind of virulent organisms that can be implicated is the Pseudomonas species, pneumococci, Haemophilus uh, influenzae, and even Staphylococci. But it's going to cause a whole bunch of ischemic changes, right, and hemorrhaging. 
and that starts within the medulla near the thin wall vessels and it's going to progress into the cortex okay so if you have that down you should be solid um, and then we're going to cover addison's disease okay addison's disease like it sounds is dealing with the adrenocorticoid insufficiency so we're going to have excess production of what you're going to have a a basic etiology that's caused by a adrenal gland being affected by some kind of autoimmune disease, such as thyroid disease, premature ovarian failure, or type 1 diabetes. It can be also infectious causes um, or metastatic causes as well. Now, diagnosis, what you're going to do is administration of ACTH analog to see how well they respond to the adrenal gland, right? Um, within about 15 to 30 minutes of ACTH infusion, basically it should release um, some amount of cortisol output. Since cortisol isn't being outputted, the patient is gonna feel very fatigued, right? Progressive weakness and easy fatigability because cortisol is important for this. You're gonna have hyperpigmentation because you have so much ACTH production that you don't know what to do with it and your pro opiomelanocorticoins are going to be upregulated, right? So you're gonna get bronzing of the skin uh, you're going to get hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, because you're losing water um, and salt and high volume depletion and hypotension, right? That's why the patients get very, very tired very, very quickly. Now we get to the entire pathway of the glomerulosa fasciculata and reticularis, okay? Remember, we start off with cholesterol, okay? Cholesterol um, desmolase gets converted into pregnolone um, via the STAR kind of pathway. And that's accumulative information from our time in term two. It's going to get converted to um, pregnolone. From pregnolone, it can be converted into several different pathways. And the important thing to note is that we test ourselves based off of the 17 hydroxylase deficiency um, versus your 21, right? Hydroxylase deficiency um, versus your, your overall 11 hydroxy um, hydroxylase deficiencies. And I've kind of outlined all of them. Now, the important thing to note is that your adrenals are primarily regulated by ACTH, but your mineral acorticoids are regulated by the renin-angiotensin pathway. There's very minimal effects that's coming from your um, other systems. So keep that in mind and you should be solid. Um, remember, this is a nice review of our time in CRS as well as RHS, so we should be solid based off of this. Now, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Remember, this is autosomal recessive in nature, and remember, most often it's impaired corticosteroid synthesis on a post-action of ACTH and therefore adrenal hyperplasia, depending on what zone is affected. So there are three major ones that we often get tested on, 21, 11, and 17. The 21 component, I like to think of as the most common because everyone goes wild when they're 21. Um, and that's the important thing to note there. So what gets affected? 21 is the most common. So what's going to be messed up is mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids. So this is gone and this is gone. So only thing that gets in excess is androgens. So that's really important because the androgens is going to lead to increased virilization heritism, and a lot of different things in folks. Now, your 11-beta-hydroxylase is going to increase your mineral acorticoids, decrease your glucocorticoids, and increase your androgens. And I want to make sure you guys review that pathway so you guys are solid. And then finally, your 17-alpha-hydroxylase is increased mineral acorticoids, decreased glucocorticoids, and decreased androgens. So the only thing that's elevated in 17 is mineral acorticoids. So I like to memorize only ones that are um, increased, and that way I know that everything else is decreased. So um, often presenting features of this is hypoglycemia, right, due to the glucocorticoids, because the glucocorticoids in all of them are shut down, are always shut down, whether it's 21, 11, or 17. Then you have your hypernatremia or hyponatremia, depending on if your mineral corticoids is affected. And then you can have um, abnormal external genitalia due to the androgens, right, the androgen excess or decrease. And you're going to look for salt water crisis um, or salt wasting slash retention crises involved with this. And you should be solid after reviewing those. A nice little summary of it is given in first aid. And I literally pulled this from our time in ER. Um, and if you guys review it, you guys will have a firm understanding of what's happening with each of these steps. So 21 hydroxylase is involved with um, 
as I mentioned, is the most common. And it's going to, whenever you see a one, right, that's going to tell you that there's some kind of um, effect on the female, right? Whether that's um, increased virilization early on, um, which is basically really important in terms of like hair growth and all sorts of things that's often associated with males. So keep that in mind. Um, and that's how I kept the kept these straight. Whenever you see one first, it's going to mess with um, your blood pressure. So if one comes first, such as 17 and 11, it's going to be increased BP, right? So keep that in mind. Um, and that's how I like to remember this. Although the 11 beta hydroxylase, it has decreased aldosterone. And you'd be thinking, well, if it's decreased aldosterone, your mineral corticoids would be down. But there is a modest increase in your 11 deoxycorticosterone. Uh, um, and that's associated with slightly increased BP. And that's why you're seeing an increased BP here. Now, this part I pulled directly from first data, and I want you guys to review it. But the part I wanted to outline is that if the deficiency enzyme starts with one, it causes hypertension. If the deficiency enzyme start, ends with one, it causes virilization in females. And that's a quick and easy way to remember what's happening with the females. Because if you have the female one down, then you know what's happening exact opposite with the males. Once again, here's a nice review overall of what's happening um, of each location pulled directly from AMBOSS. Now let's cover a couple of the easier stuff and get this out of the way. Pheochromocytoma is associated with what? It's associated with your chromaffin cells, right? Those are right here. Um, and they're basically, um, they're, they're neuroendocrine in origin. And once again, what's affected with pheochromocytoma, it's due to the fact that there's excess production of um, medullary components, such as your epi, nor epi, that leads to what we see in terms of episodic presentation of um, hypertension, uh, palpitations, and so on and so forth. Now, the rule of 10 applies with pheochromocytoma. So there's a 10% chance of uh, extra adrenal presentation, such as the organ of Zuckendahl, which is, a, you're like, where? what is this organ talking about? It's basically in the inferior mesenteric artery, there is the um, involvement of, or the formation of a, a, a glandular-like structure that starts producing um, these medullary hormones, such as epi and nor epi. Right? That's why you're going to get episodic presentations. There, there's a 10% chance of malignancy, 10% chance of sporadic bilateral presentation, and 10% not associated with hypertension. So um, once again, it's an inherited form often seen with um, multi-endocrine neoplasias, 2A and 2B. Remember with this, um, it's involved with the Rett syndrome, so as well as neurofibromatosis type 1, as well as um, VHL syndrome as well. Okay, neuroblastic tumors. Whenever I told you guys about neuroblastic, it's often presents in young children. Blastic in nature, it's often uh, young in children. And what you need to remember with this is the Homer Wright um, pseudo rosettes. Okay, so those are basically tumor cells that are concentrated in these like circular flower-like patterns. Um, and they're, they're basically filled with neurophils, the absence of actual central lumen is kind of important, but they're tumors of the sympathetic ganglia, right? Like remember the ganglia that run parallel to the spinal cord and they're neural crest cells in origin. Um, and they have extra cranial solid tumors of the childhood and often familial, and they're often presented young. And guess what? Just like pheochromocytoma, they're going to present with, um, increased VMA and HVA because remember these are catecholamines that are eventually released and um, neuroblastic. So you're throwing these flowers at these kids. So that's how I remember the, the pseudo rosettes. Okay, diabetes mellitus. This one's uh, very self-explanatory. Remember, you can either have a reduced insulin secretion, a decreased glucose utilization or increased glucose production, okay? The most often complication with diabetes mellitus is end-stage renal disease, right? That's because you're getting these Kimmel Wilson nodules, you're getting um, hyaline arteriosclerosis, so many different things presented with this. And adults, it's gonna often present with diabetic retinopathy, predisposition for cardiovascular disease, because remember, um, so much of pressure is built up with diabetes and glucose is a osmotically active component. 
Um, and you can act, actually have auto amputations. If you guys remember, gangrenes can often appear with this and you should be solid if you remember that. Classifications, autoimmune diseases, right? Um, type one is associated with autoimmune. Beta pancreatic cells are bye-bye, right? Those are your islets of Langerhan beta cells. And the important thing to note is that the diabetes type two is often associated with insulin resistance, right? Autoimmune destruction versus insulin resistance. And this is really important um, the diabetes mellitus often primary often occurs after a exposure to a virus or a damage done by some kind of um, drug. So keep that in mind, um, as well as there's a genetic preponderance seen with Down and Turner syndrome. Okay, 21 chromosomes, right? Um, translocation versus uh, Turner syndrome, which is just an XO um, individual. Okay. Ideology, like I said, um, it's associated with if you buy four diamonds and only pay for three, you get one free. So DR4 and DR3 is associated with diabetes mellitus. And you're probably wondering what is HLA3? Um, Those are the ones that um, eventually code for um, the major histocompatibility proteins, right? Um, these, are, these are really core genetic templates that are involved with the presentation that we're seeing here. Um, and when they go wrong in terms of what they code for, they're, they often have, um, you know, they have deleterious effects on our system. Now, uh, ironically, type 1 diabetes has a less preponderance with inheritance as compared to type 2, which is very interesting because you would think since it's autoimmune in nature that it would come from typically a familial history, not necessarily. There are environmental factors that are coupled with this. Coxsackie B, rubella, CMV, mumps, and drugs and other toxins can mess with this. And often um, you're going to have like these autoantibodies against your islets of Langerhan, and that can lead to beta cell destruction. Okay. And they often present with when you have greater than 90% of the B cell of beta cells destroyed. Now, funny thing, like I mentioned, type 2 diabetes actually has a greater preponderance when you have. Um, a familial history of it. So first degree relatives, there's a five to 10 for 10% 10 increase in risk. There's no HLA association with this. Um, and typically there's an environmental kind of component to it. So often think of obesity, lifestyle changes um, associated with this weight loss and exercise have just been recommended nonstop aside from giving diabetes um, medication. So that's a very important component. Type one versus type two remember that there is a HLA association with DM, right? Type one, and then there's a type, in type two, there's nothing, right? So um, remember this component, there's insulinitis. So there is inflammatory cells and infiltrates in type one. And then in type two, there's actually amyloid deposition in the islets. So keep that in mind um, and you should be good in terms of how it presents. So. Diabetic ketoacidosis, you guys have seen it time and time again. It's going to present with the classic type that you've seen, cusmal breathing, um, nephropathy, retinopathy, um, neuropathies, all presenting together in tandem, hypoglycemia. Um, so many different things can present with this overall kind of complication, acute versus uh, over, over like long periods of time in terms of chronicity. Okay. Chronic hyperglycemia, very important. Um, why you need to know this? is that uh, it's often associated with hypoosmolar, hypo, hyperosmotic um, syndrome. It's when you're severely dehydrated because you're constantly having high glucose levels, which is osmotically active, that's pulling out too much water for you to compensate. So the ratio of sugar to water is basically off. And that leads to people with um, diabetes often getting strokes, hypovolemia, and here you often have um, absence of ketoacidosis and its symptoms because your system is just overall just shutting down, right? Um, hyperglycemia is, is usually more severe in diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, here, it would be less severe. You'd have to do quick management of fluid replacement and insulin. Now, why is chronic states of high glucose bad? You would think glucose is an energy rich and active product. What it leads to is um, basically advanced glycosylation of end products. Glycosylation is one of the ways we regulate and osmotically function a lot of different proteins. But when you glycosylate haphazardly, you're gonna change a lot of different things. It's gonna to lead to retinopathies. It's gonna to lead to cataracts, um, glaucoma, so many different things. 
The other thing is you can have sugar alcohols, which are osmotically active. Now, a quick DM level throwback is that glucose to sorbitol is done by aldose reductase, and you can actually have it a um, upregulation of this due to some kind of deficiency downstream. So keep that in mind. You can present this with um, multiple biochemistry pathways. Okay. Diabetic rep retinopathy, like I mentioned, this is the leading cause of end-stage renal failure. It's going to present with hyperfiltration because remember, glucose is going to rip through the glomerular filtration barrier. Um, and it's going to lead to microalbuminuria because albumin is lost in the um, as you're ripping through the glomerular filtration barrier, and the proteinuria is going to follow directly with it after. Okay, so what are you going to see? You're going to see hyaline arterial low sclerosis, right? It's going to be small vessels, especially the afferent component becoming thicker. And your efferent component, due to the fact that it's not getting enough blood, is actually going to atrophy, right? That's a really important um, high-yield concept from our time in FDCM and um, the renal module, because when you're working with this, you're going to have multiple kind of cluing in factors with this. Once again, glycosylation um, is bad. It's going to increase uh, the activation of TGF-beta, and you're going to also get these... Um, increased collagen depositions and these nodules start forming and they're known as the Kimmelstein Wilson nodules. Diabetic retinopathy, like I mentioned, it's going to lead to intraocular pressure. It can lead to glaucoma and it's an open angle glaucoma that's typically activated due to the fact that sugars are osmotically active and it can be quite bad. And you can have neuropathies as well with this and that's quite severe in nature. Um, you can have paresthesias of the limb, you can have the hand in glove kind of symptoms, muscle atrophy, weaknesses, impotence, orthostatic hypertension, so many different things, ischemia, neuropathies, etc. And remember with this, you're going to have um, one ischemia leading to a dry gangrene, and then you superimpose a infection on top of this, um, that's going to lead to a wet gangrene, which is another thing that's going to lead to an auto amputation. A kind of a quick summary of our time in drugs. Whenever you're thinking of exogenous insulin release, it's going to be high levels of insulin, low levels of C-peptide. Prol insulin is going to be low or absent, and sulfonylurea is absent. Whereas sulfonylurea drugs, they're often high in insulin and C-peptide because they're they're basically kickstarting your pancreas to do more. Prol insulin is going to be present, and sulfonylurea drugs are going to be present as well. Here is a nice summary of all of it. Um, there are hereditary slash environmental factors. Um, and if you guys are running through your differentials for this, you're gonna see a lot of different um, systemic presentations with this glomerular sclerosis, um, diffuse or with Kimmel Wilstein um, nodules. You're gonna have a sexual dysfunction. You can have um, any sort of effect with congestive heart failure and several other things, as well as cerebral vascular disease due to edema um, associated with this as well. And you can have diabetic foot, neuropathy, hand and gloves kind of syndrome, um, so many things. Overall, thank you guys for staying. I know this was a long kind of review. Hopefully I covered all of the high yield points and let me know if you guys have any questions.